Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and I appreciate that. This is the one and only Maverick Podcast. I'm your host, DJ Maverick, and today we're going to roll out the red carpet. We have a Latinx woman, mom, musician, and educator of Bolivian and United States heritage, the one and only Christina Ades. Welcome to the show. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so, so happy to be here with you. Thank you. No, thank you. We were just talking about, uh, you know, it's Sunday morning. So, you know, some people sleep in and stuff. So I know you're taking time out of your busy schedule and I'm taking, you know, nap time. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for, for sacrificing your siesta time. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, no, it was totally worth it. And I saw your list. I'm super excited. But before we dive into that, for the probably 1% of the people out there that don't know you, just give us elevator pitch of who you are and what you do. Okay. Ooh, elevator pitch. Okay. <laughs> um, reel me in if I start going on too long. Um, well, my name is Christina Otis. Again, I am a, um, a musician. I am a educator. I currently work as a full-time Spanish instructor at the University of Oklahoma. Um, I am also a musician since probably I could barely walk. And um, that always is something that permeates everything I do. So my Spanish classes at OU, we include a lot of music, video, telling the stories about Latinx people that we don't always hear. So I really try and uh, incorporate that. I also work um, a, a musically. I'm part of the duo Alegría Real. It's a duo with Armando Rivera, the wonderful one and only percussionist Armando Rivera. Um, and we're on the Oklahoma Arts Council as performing artists. So most recently we've been doing a lot with the Neighborhood Arts Program. It's bringing music and culture and art to the public libraries in the metro area. Okay. And so, um, yeah, that's what I'm kind of doing professionally. Um, like you said, my mom is from Bolivia. So I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan um to a bolivian mama and a gringo united states dad <laughs> awesome and yeah yeah spent a little time spent my first 11 years there okay and, and then and then moved to norman oklahoma and then graduated from high school from norman high and got out to the west coast and lived in santa cruz california oops, for a while and came back I actually went to college out in Santa Cruz, California. Okay. That's where I awesome. graduated my undergraduate degree at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and lived out there and worked out there after graduating for some time. Came back to Norman for a, a period of time. That's when I worked as coordinator for Latino Student Services. That's when I met you. That's right. Yeah, it was so yes. awesome. Like yes. you were just like part of, part of our crew. Like, oh, <laughs> you man. Know? what a special time. What a you were always time. there for us and uh, we always had a great time. And I think your office was just like a hangout. So all, all yeah. the students would just kind of hang out. You're probably like, okay, I got to get some work done here. No, guys. no, no, no. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful thing. And, and then after that, I moved back out to Santa Cruz, California for a time. Uh -huh. um, my first child was born there. I have two children. Rocio, who's 16, Karina, who's 13. And then eventually we made our way back to Norman, and here I am. Okay, um, awesome. And in between that time, I've, I've traveled to a lot of different places, lived and worked in different places, including Oaxaca, Mexico, Guadalajara, Mexico, Quito, Ecuador, um, Guatemala. Japan, I've seen a lot of some pictures Kyoto, from Japan, Japan, really cool. Yeah. Beijing, China, uh, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, um, and then of course Bolivia. We had the great fortune of, even though I didn't live there, we, we spent lots of time in Bolivia because that was the motherland, yeah. you know, on my mom's side. So Awesome. Yes. Well, you gave us a lot there. I want to go a little bit back and I want to talk a little bit about sort of when you were growing up and what, what type of kid were you? You said you grew up in Michigan, right? So what was that Correct. like? Um, well, yeah, Ann Arbor, Michigan is... Um, you know, it's a lot of things. It was the, it's the University of Michigan. It's very near Detroit. Um, it's a university town. I grew up in the seventies in mm -hmm. Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, I was a really, really shy kid. Um, some people don't believe that. No, I'm, I, don't. I'm a, I'm <laughs> I don't see <laughs> I'm it. <laughs> well, I'm one of those, uh, I'm an introvert really. I need a lot of alone time, Yeah. but, but when I'm on, like when I'm teaching or performing, yeah. You know, it, that's kind of where I come out. Um, but 
I was a very shy kid, um, but but we in Ann Arbor, Michigan, with my mama from Bolivia and my dad, um, we had always had a lot of international people around, a lot of friends from all over the world. I think that really influenced me, cool. um, like for Thanksgiving and stuff. You know, my both of my parents worked at the university there in student services, um, and I think the thing that to this day, and but it was definitely like a lifesaver for me as a kid. Music was the thing that made me feel most at home. Always. So even as a kid, it was like always even music? as a kid. Yeah, always okay. like um, I started doing piano and my mom made all three of us take piano lessons, my two older brothers and I, but they weren't that into it. And they're like, oh, man, we have to <laughs> practice. <laughs> and you were and like, was, yeah, you were looking forward to I it. I was like, heck, yeah, because yeah. Even though the little primer book that we had to learn sometimes boring pieces out of, I always like would get that done. And then I was I would like make up stuff on the piano. And that's the part I was like, oh, that other stuff that I have to do. OK, I'll just do it so that I can just like how miraculous is this? The world of music. right? Yeah. And, how, and so and then later I discovered my brother's. This was at about age 12. My brother's 68 Fender Stratocaster guitar. And that just was like love at first strum. I was like, what? This <laughs> <laughs> like crank it to 11, let's go. <laughs> yeah, crank it to 11. And um, so, you know, that's kind of, and, and, and at that time I was like, I said 12, you know, adolescence like is coming and it's awkward as hell. And just, mm -hmm. it's just, and we had just moved to Oklahoma recently so it was very different culturally so what type of music would you sort of gravitate to did you, you know you had all that international yes. exposure but was your music like 70s classic rock or was it pop yeah. or what were you listening to you know it, like everyone i think it changed over time but i think like like i said in our house we were exposed to a lot of different music including like bluegrass mm -hmm. from my dad's side really kick-ass like virtuosic bluegrass you know nice. um Yes, beautiful. And on my mom, she loved a lot of like um, classical music, especially the romantic pianist. She she plays. She plays oh, yeah? Chopin. Oh my God, oh, beautifully. Wow. That's and another huge influence. That's really my, cool. I didn't know yeah, that. She'd be, yeah, she would be sitting at the piano and she played with so much of emotion. I, and I think that influenced me as a musician. She really put a lot of herself in it. I remember she'd be like swaying and she was playing Chopin. And I'd be like, man, like I, I always thought, Wow, because I would see like my other tias, some of my other tias played piano too. Yeah. Um, but they didn't move really. They would just be like, da, 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 yeah, done. And my mom was into it. I was like, yeah. wow, there's something here. But I think really like, you know, when I started playing the guitar and and getting into my you know teen years, um, I was really influenced by a lot of blues. My older brother's record collection, of course, your older whatever your older siblings say, you're like, okay, let me get let me see your records, and they're like, you should listen to this. Yeah. Muddy Waters, BB King, Coco Taylor, Etta James, Billy Holiday. Okay. Um, and then I was also my other brother and I were real into like the R and B and the soul. Like I, I, I actually I, there was a time I was really into Motown, and then I got into like DeBarge, you know, as that evolved out of Motown and. Um, you know, and then Prince. Oh my God, when I discovered Prince. Yeah, spoiler alert, it's on your spoiler list. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Yeah. So, yeah. and then even Jimi Hendrix, like Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, uh -huh. um, Los Lobos, um, you know, uh, a, a lot. And importantly, this is also on my list, but the trips that we would take in the summer, especially as, a, as a, I was a teen, um, I really got into music from Latin America. Okay. You know, and, and, and music that um, but I was particularly moved by and still am by the music that was always tied to social justice movements. Mm -hmm. And it was cool because my one of my primos, he had like a whole room in his house in Bolivia of just albums of everything, not just that kind of music. Like he had a little jazz and rock. And it was so cool because when we go and hang out in Bolivia in the summers, I would be in Ronnie's uh, room all the time, just going, oh my God, and just listening and putting on new records. It was like a kid in a candy store. Like, what does this sound like? Mm -hmm. What does this sound like? And so, yeah. What type of uh, Latin music was it? Like salsa, merengue, like what, just all over? It was more like, not so much salsa, merengue. I got into that later when I was like in college, okay. um, which I love, um, but it was more like, um, folkloric music that was like the music of Chile, Argentina, Bolivia, that was part of what is sometimes called the new song movement that um, 
it was during like the 70s um, when there were a lot of repressive governments in Chile, Bolivia, mm -hmm. Argentina, and the artists and the musicians, um, you know, through their music and oftentimes using indigenous instruments to the country, you know, um, uh, would compose lyrics that were relevant to the social struggles of the day and, and okay. to try and you know, fight for equity. And you incorporate that now, right? With your, oh, your yeah. current band, you have like a lot of like native instruments, a lot of traditional yes. instruments, right? So yes. you play like yes. a ton of instruments. Tell us a little bit about that, like just the different instruments. Well, yeah, um, I've been really blessed to work with Armando Rivera, a good friend and a co-conspirator in <laughs> creating music. Um, he and I have played, you know, we try and we've learned a lot and we've played Latin American music from all over. One of the uh, two of the instruments that I really hold dear that I play besides the guitar um, is the charango. It's a 10 stringed uh, Bolivian instrument from Bolivia. Well, it's, it's from Bolivia and the Peru area. And um, also the siku, the sampoña, bamboo flo flute. Okay. And and I also play cavaquinho. It's a little four string instrument, uh, like a ukulele size, but with steel strings, not nylon string, uh, from Brazil. And I haven't played it much lately, but um, I've also played the um, cuatro from Cuba. Okay. So yeah. Is it difficult to like get the instruments? Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Not the cuatro. Cuatro is from uh, Puerto Rico. The tres. From, from Cuba. Yeah. Okay. Is it difficult to find the instruments or do you have to like well, source them from the countries or you know, for work? those, I, I, I haven't played those last two that I mentioned recently, the Cavaquinho and the Tres. Uh -huh. but Armando, Armando, he knows a million musicians around okay. this area and beyond. And so he would get that. Uh, now okay. I'm playing, mainly I focus on my nylon string guitar that is acoustic electric and my uh, Siku, my Bolivian pound pipes and my charango. The okay. 10 string. Yeah. Do you prefer the acoustic or the electric or, you know, I it just prefer... depends on what type of vibe you're in? Well, I mean, in terms of listening, I listen to it all. But in terms of playing, I really love the um, nylon string okay. guitar because I love to play a lot of bossa type stuff, you know, Brazilian bossa and jazz. And, and um, I compose some songs. I, I have original songs that are kind of a lot of them are influenced by those chords and that style. And I've, um, I also trained classically as an undergraduate, as a music major at UC Santa Cruz. And so with classical guitar training, you know, you use your fingernails and mm -hmm. um, I'm definitely not, I'm definitely not, um, that's not my main focus, classical guitar, but I learned so much from that tradition that influenced my playing style and technique. Got it. Okay. So yeah. your major was in music? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, it was a major in music, um, main instrument, guitar, classical guitar. And what was really cool about at Santa Cruz at the time, they also had an option to focus on a different area or type of music. And there was actually a professor there, more than one professor there. Um, they had a Latin American folkloric music ensemble. Oh, okay. And, and Latin and music and also classes like ethnomusicology classes where you learn about the cultural context for this music. I mean, it was wonderful. It was very affirming because it was also affirming of my heritage in the ivory tower in academia. You sure. Know? It wasn't like I had to choose classical or Western European, you know, white men or something just because that's all they offered. They offered right. more, and then I and I could connect with that. So yeah, that was my focus. Very cool. All right. Well, we're going to get into your list. We're going to start with uh, number 10 here. And That's it's funny. a really cool track. I really like this track. Just tell us a little bit about this track. We're talking about Golden and Jill Scott. Tell us how this it, track it made <laughs> the top 10. Okay. I love this song because this song is about joy and about embodying your joy and your freedom. And that is something that I really strive to do, um, no matter what's going on in life, right? I mean, you know, we all have ups and downs and in-betweens, um, and it's not about it's not about denying those things, but it's taking that and saying, you know what? How am I going to, you know, take all of that and still just, you know, just celebrate the fact that I'm alive and try yeah. and encourage others in what I do and wherever, whatever spaces I find myself. So it's about joy. Um, I like it. I'm, the lyric says, I'm taking my freedom. I'm putting it in my song. I'm singing loud and strong. Um, 
sing it all day long, putting it in my stroll and letting the joy unfold. I mean, that that's a beautiful thing. And, and I it whenever puts I hear, you in a good vibe. Like oh as soon as you turn it on, God. it's like you feel like dancing, right? like you get the day started, right? Exactly. This is and this is one that I I'll put this on in my car and just turn it up when I'm driving down the highway and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> awesome. And my kids love it too. And so we we have it on several playlists in the car. And when we when it comes on, we're like, turn it up, and we're all just Sweet. jamming. <laughs> and it's just it's a beautiful. And she's a, I mean she's a powerhouse vocalist and an yeah. amazing person. Jill and Scott. that's one thing about you is like every time I see you, you're always like in a good mood. You're always like super energetic. How do you do that? Because you know I know other people. You can tell when they're having a bad day, but with you, like. Where, you know, if I see you at a show, you're playing or whatever, like you're always happy. How do you stay in that good mood? Well, you're lucky you've caught me on those days, Luis. <laughs> uh <-oh. laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, of course, I have my times where I'm not up and on. Um, probably the times we've seen each other, though, have, have to do with music context, yeah, mostly. For sure. Yeah. And, uh, and like we've discussed, you know, that is uh, music is my medicine. Music is the thing for me mm -hmm. that heals and puts me in a great mood you know no matter what's happening in my life and so um yeah you know one thing though Luis, um i i'm i really work every day like i wake up early uh -huh. to try and make a little space for myself like how early are we talking i'm talking 5 a.m oh, oh no excuse wow. me not five what am i talking about five? where did that come from i guess that's what i aspire to six <laughs> that's still early though yeah. that's still early because you know i'm a single mom um of two teenagers and it gets busy and even you know it's just nice to have a time when everything's quiet and i just take about 20 minutes with my cafecito you know and i do mm -hmm. a little yoga and i do a little meditation and i and i really just try and like focus on my breathing and focusing on what I really want to cultivate in, in my life. That's Joy. awesome. I've heard that like yoga is like huge. How'd you get into that? I got, I think probably back in the day in college, I think there were classes at University of California, Santa Cruz, and I started taking classes. And then I also had done it here in Norman with a wonderful uh, studio called Ashtanga Studio. Andrew Epler, he's a great uh, instructor. And now I just do it at home by myself. Okay. And I think it's the whole thing of the regularity of it, um, doing uh -huh. it every morning. So to answer your question, I think that that helps me stay in a space where even if stuff is just going badly and I'm struggling, it at least gives me a sense. I think that practice I have gives me a sense that, okay, deep breaths into this, you're not alone. You're mm -hmm. not the first person who's gone through, through this. You will not be the last. Um, this will pass. Um, so just just breathe into it and have empathy for yourself, you know, so you can have empathy for others. So that helps me, I think, that practice. Awesome. So tell yeah. me, so you were a music major, you graduated, and then what was your plan after that? Like, you, did you want to, like, teach or did you want to, you know, do something with music? What was the plan mm -hmm. after that? So... I didn't really have a plan after I graduated from college, <laughs> much to my parents' dismay. No, they, they were always very encouraging, actually. Um, but I, when I graduated from Santa Cruz, I played for a while with a couple of different groups um, in the area, and we play all around the uh, Central Coast and the Bay Area. Um, one of them was a folkloric group called Chuchumbe. There were four of us, Mario, Gwen, Steven, and I, and we played you know, a lot of folkloric music from Chile and Argentina and Bolivia. And we'd play wherever we could, parties, happy hours at, you know, whatever Latino restaurant, um, festivals. And we hustled doing that. Um, but of course that wasn't enough to pay the bills. So I always had some other job. I was waitressing also at a sushi restaurant at that time. At one point I had three jobs. I was doing the music, <laughs> waitressing and, um, this is how I kind of got into more in teaching, though. I also got hired to be a bilingual teaching assistant at some of the public schools there in Santa okay. Cruz. And because I saw they needed Spanish speakers and the only requirement was that you would had a college degree, I think was the requirement. And, and you were bi bilingual. Um, and so I became a, a assistant, you know, to the to the kindergarten teacher at one point. Then it was a fifth grade teacher, fourth grade teacher. And I got to work the small groups of kids because the teacher usually was just overwhelmed with, you know, like the huge class. And they'd be like, okay, oh, you're yeah. going to take this group of students and work on reading. Are you going to do this? And I 
found, I fell into that and found how much I loved encouraging um, young kids. A lot of the kids that were in my classes that I worked with were, were Latino kids, Latinx kids, you know, of mm -hmm. mostly Mexican heritage. Did you find yourself sneaking in a guitar and instrument oh, yeah. oh, and incorporating yeah. and then, that? <laughs> oh, for sure. And they jumped on it. The teachers yeah. loved that. They go, oh, what? What? You play guitar? Um, okay. Every one Monday awesome. we're doing music or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, which was very cool. So, and so I did that for a while. Um, yeah. And then I ended up after some years coming back to Norman, Oklahoma for a little bit. And I taught Spanish for a little bit. And then I got the job at the Center for Student Life at OU coordinating Latino student services. Um, yeah. Were your parents already in Norman at yes. the time? Yeah. yeah. Okay. They were in Norman. So that was cool. And that was before I became a mom. Right. And um, I love that job that you were, you were talking about earlier. It was such a learning experience for me to work with so many amazing students um, like yourself at the time, you know, um, Sorry to building. disappoint afterwards. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Are you kidding? But 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 I learned so much, and you know, uh, that was just a very special time. Yeah, and, and you get I to think, hear everybody's story and their background oh, and their struggles. Man. Exactly. I, mean, I think that would be the coolest part, at least for me, like just hearing right. about everybody's story. You know. Right. Right. And and we we did. We had we all came from different lived experiences. And yet there was this thing that connected us, you know, even though we came from diverse Latinx heritages, we we had a love for each other, a love for our cultures. We showed that in our music and in dancing oh, yeah. and like the conferences that we used to go to, right? The leadership conferences mm -hmm. and um, the parties. And so, yeah, it was a beautiful time. I got my master's at that time uh, at OU too in human relations. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, so like with the music thing, did, were you always in a band? Did you always find like you've got this day job, but then, you know, night weekends you're doing music? Um, more or less, that's always been kind of the thing in my life. Um, right now, uh, I, I, like I said, I'm teaching full time um, courses at OU and in COVID times of COVID. I'm doing it via video conference via mm -hmm. Zoom, which has been a whole new learning experience. Um, and like I said, with uh, here in Oklahoma now, I'm doing a lot with Alegría Real, the duo with uh, Armando Rivera. But it kind of slows down for me right now when I'm working teaching. And in the okay. summer, I do, I do more with that in terms of playing out and performing. But I play every single day. That's, uh, that's actually another one of the things that I have to make time for every day because... Yeah. It's, it's what like I an love. outlet, right? Like it's, it is an outlet, yeah. exactly. And yeah. I don't want to lose my chops. And I always <laughs> want to be. I always want to make sure I'm making space in case a song wants to come through because I like to write songs too. Do so, you remember, like, at what point did you decide, like, hey, I want to do this in front of people? Or at what point did it click, like, I'm good at this? You know, how does how did that become? Do you remember your first show? I do, <laughs> I do, and I have <laughs> friends that still that. remember it. <laughs> Seventh grade at. The Whittier Middle School in Norman, Oklahoma talent show. My guitar teacher convinced me I was terrified. He was like, you need to play just a talent show. I guess he had a lot of students that went to Whittier uh -huh. Middle School. And he was like, you need to play. And I'm like, ah! And I kind of <laughs> wanted to, but I didn't want to. But I said, okay, what the heck? I think I've always been brave in that way. I've been shy, but I've always pushed myself. And so I did. I got up there with my brother's 68 Fender Stratocaster and my little amp, and they set up a mic, you know. And I remember singing. This is another band I used to listen to, The Who. And oh, I remember okay. I remember playing um, Substitute and singing Substitute, the song Substitute. And I was so nervous that I don't, you know, that feeling when you don't even remember playing. Uh -huh. All I remember <laughs> was finishing and everyone going, yeah. Did you remember all the lyrics or did you blank out? Oh, no, I got it. No? I, I yeah, had all the lyrics. It? I nailed okay. it. And what was cool, Luis, is there were not a lot of girls playing guitar, electric guitar yeah. at that time. So yeah. I think people and, and I was like I said, I was shy. I was a shy person and I wasn't popular or you know visible in any kind of you know mainstream way. Like, you know, was it a cheerleader or this or that? So people were like, who is this? <laughs> <laughs> Who's and this chick? At that age, did you already have your vocal chops like you do now? No, like we're, no, no, no. no. Uh -uh. Okay. But I didn't care, which is pretty cool. I don't even know how I did that. Like, I didn't even have that 
th that thought of like, oh, I don't know how to sing. Like yeah. I had no training. I still, I've never had vocal training, but, okay. um, but yeah, that, um, that was my first time. And That's I think cool. there was something after that, that even though I felt like I was going to throw up before I did it afterwards, I was like, whoa, there's something here. This, That's this cool. feels good. You know? <laughs> yeah. Tell me about the time that the stars fell on Alabama. Tell me a little bit about Ooh. that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Super oh, classic yeah. song, Yeah, right? this is that intro with the trumpet. I love it. Um, this song is a beautiful memory for me. Uh, this really is what I connect with my very first love, my very first relationship, um, where I was just like all crazy in love, heart beating fast, you know. We used to listen to this album um, on a record player with this person that I was in love with. And um, it's interesting because we, li we listened to it on the album, which even gives it more of a nostalgia. It was already an old song for us, you know, when we were listening to it. Yeah. Um, but it's very romantic. It's very intimate. Um, and we used to listen to this. And, and I love it too, because I think that was a time when CDs were just about to come out or, or were coming out, excuse me, maybe starting to. Mm -hmm. but but we were but we were still listening to our albums and um so yeah i i it's just i i associate it with that time and that memory and that feeling you know of first love and first um connection like that and i love i'm looking yeah, i'm thinking of the lyrics i never planned in my imagination a situation so heavenly a fairy land where no one else could enter and in the center it's you and me that's super intimate right yeah yeah the lyrics are awesome on this song do you remember but, how you found the song like who introduced say, you to the song that's what i say but beyond just this particular song so i got a hold of an album when i was this was before this relationship earlier when i was maybe like 14 I, I, get, I just bought a record, Greatest Hits, Billie Holiday, okay. right? I used to li I used to listen to records like a lot of us, you know, and I remember putting it on and going, whoa, like from the minute I heard her voice, yeah, it was a revelation to me because I thought there is nobody that sounds like Billie Holiday. Mm -hmm. She is one of the greatest of all time. And she, I, I listened to her voice and I thought, this woman doesn't care about sounding like anybody else but herself. You know, yeah. I don't even think I could articulate that at the time. And it's time. all about the voice, right? Because it's, it's not exactly. really about like the presentation or, you know, right. it's, it's all not about a lot of, like the talent, you know, the, there's exactly. not a fluff. Exactly. <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah, there was no hiding it. And her phrasing was very conversational of how she, you know, and I thought, wow. And, and she wasn't trying too hard, you know, and she was just herself. And I, and I don't even think I, I couldn't have articulated that to you, Luis, at the time when I heard it, but that planted a seed in me. I yeah. think that's an important message for young people and a young girl. Like, you don't have to sound like anyone else, both musically and just in your life. Cultivate yeah. your own voice, you know? Or even fit in just in general, right? Exactly. Like, be, be you, you know? You're unique for a reason, right? Right, right. And I think that really spoke to me at that time because I never felt like I fit in. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's how I discovered her. And I just was fascinated by her. I loved her. And I started learning a little bit more about her life and I learned how much she suffered, you know, and, but, but she put it all in her music and that was powerful. And she used to always, I think a quote that she, of hers is, um, for me, she said, uh, when I sing or when it's in a song, it, it's never work if I can feel it. It never feels like work if I can feel what I'm singing. Yeah. And I thought that was powerful. And then I also just want to say about Billie Holiday, I recognize how she is the mother, the musical mother of other singers that are amazing today, like who I love, who didn't make the list, but if I had, an, maybe next time, <laughs> Erica <laughs> part Badu, two. part two, Erica yeah. Badu, I'm a huge fan of Erica Badu. Mm -hmm. I can hear Billie Holiday in her voice. Yeah. Uh, Nora Jones, I can hear Billie in her voice. So she is one of the greatest of all time. Awesome. And I uh, really admire her and love her. So does this song bring you happiness or is it, since it's oh. tied to the, you know, a romantic love? You're right, like, which uh, ultimately you know. ended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it doesn't actually. Yeah. There's some songs like that, but not this one. Actually, it, it um, not that everything was perfect about that relationship, right? But, but that moment when we listened to this, 
Mm-hmm. It was perfect. It was beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Tell me, so uh, was there ever a point where you were like, okay, I just want to do music 100%. Like, that's what I want to do. I want to be an artist. I, yeah. You know, I did think about that many times. Um, uh, but I think that I ultimately um, decided that it's not I, all of the hustling of having to be, like I said, there's a big part of me that's an introvert. Yeah. You know, and um, I, I like, find that a ton of musicians are that way. I don't know yeah. why, but, you know, some of the greatest are like, you know, super shy, super, you know, they, they don't really like people. <laughs> like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> but then they're on stage and they just turn into something else like yeah, somebody else. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think for me, I just never I don't have the business hustle at all, you know, and I'm not interested in that. Um, mm-hmm. And I also just wasn't. I wasn't interested in being a performing artist all the time. I'm also a person who likes, I like, I like to get deep into learning and reading and I love teaching too. And, um, and then of course, when I became uh, a mama, um, of of two children, um, you know, I, I, I just, I like the stability also of having like the job at OU that, you know, could help me pay the bills, but I could still be working on music. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Tell me a little bit about how the travel came about and how you've gone to so many different places. I mean, it's your list is pretty amazing. Yeah, thank you. I, um, well, you know, I have a mom who's been to 66 countries. Oh, wow. That's a lot. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think there's some 100 and I don't know how many nations on our planet, but she's Mm -hmm. been to a lot of them. And, uh, she always instilled in me, um, this kind of, like I said, from, from everything from bringing people from all over the world into our home, inviting them in to just her life, because mainly she worked and her passion has always been in, um, encouraging students from the United States to travel abroad. So she started a lot of the study abroad programs at OU and then also welcoming the international students really welcoming them, you know, into their lives here in the United States. Cause she knows she's, she was an international student herself, you know, Bolivia is her home country and she's made the United States her home, but she always encouraged me, which, which I, to this day, like, especially as a mother now, I think, wow, that's amazing because it's really a tendency from our, you know, us mommies to be like, I just want, you don't, don't go anywhere. Right. You know, stay. (laughs) Yeah. She, but she was like fly me. I mean, not that didn't make her sad, but she Mm -hmm. always encouraged me. So like my first big trip, I never considered Bolivia, you know, a foreign country because that's like home, homeland. So we had been to Bolivia many times all growing up. My first like, quote, like foreign country and feeling like a stranger was Japan when I was 14. Even before I did my study abroad year in college in Japan, I went for like a, like a month in the summer because we had a friend who was from Japan and she had come, I think she was studying English at OU in their ESL program. And she was living in our home and we just became really tight all of us she was like our other family member and she said hey why don't you come because i got really interested i would mm-hmm. ask her how do you say this like teach me some japanese and um she said why don't you just come stay with my family like for a month and i was like really and i asked my mom and she was like okay let's do it so that was a big deal for me i mean i was yeah. scared to go because i'd never been that far and such a different and the culture. language right the language yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I just, you know, with my mom's blessing and kind of just this feeling of like, mm, I need to do this. I went. And yeah, and I find the Japanese culture, you tell me if it's true or not, but they take pride in like everything they do. Like you oh, could be yeah. like, you know, you sweeping the streets or you could be creating woodwork or whatever. Right. And they just like become a master at that at that one thing. Right. That is well said. Exactly. I mean, that is exactly the case. Um yeah. So, I mean, there was so much to be fascinated by um, there. And I think that really that really got the bug in me of like, wow. I mean, even just in that month, being in such a different culture, um, it's so eye opening. You also challenge yourself as a person because I was terrified to be away. Yeah. And there were times in that yet as a 14 year old where I was like, Oh my God, will I ever get back to the States? And like, what I was like, I kind of had little panic attacks sometimes, Mm -hmm. but at the same time I was learning all this stuff and I had a loving family there that that were showing me things and, you know, introducing me to 
um, broiled eel unagi for the first time and taken oh, me wow. to these Buddhist temples. I'd never mm -hmm. been to these Buddhist temples. You know, I'd always seen these iglesias, catedrales, you know, uh, but like Buddhist religion was totally a revelation. I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. And so I think I grew a lot in that little month. I said, you know what? I thought I couldn't do it, but I did. Very cool. And I, and when you I travel, went, do you, uh, are you open to trying like all the local food or do you sort of look for, for like some comfort food or something that you can identify when you're traveling? No, when I travel, I want to do the local thing. Okay. Because what's the point, you know, like yeah. what? <laughs> in my, in my way of thinking about it, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah. Because I hear about these hip hop artists, they travel everywhere, right? And the first thing they look for is a McDonald's. Oh, man. <laughs> oh. I'm like, you're missing the point. You're missing the point, dude. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or take their chef with them or something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was very I mean, cool. I, I think you learn so much about a culture through their food and through music, you know, musica, yeah. food, comida, all of that. And then you just kind of just traveled from then on. You just so, like went so, all over. Yeah. So then like when I was in college, I went to Kyoto for a year. I spent a year in the study abroad program. That was amazing. Oh, my gosh. Um, and then I um, and then I continued to go back to Bolivia, like to see family all throughout. And um, one time I uh, on the way back from Bolivia to, to the States, I went to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And that was really cool because I was I was starting to get into um, Brazilian artists, okay. And 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 I love oh my gosh Brazil is such a rich culture musically oh my gosh, um, and so I just loved being there. I love the way they said my name. Like instead of saying Cristina, they say Cristina, Cristina. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I know, and I just was like I always joke with my Spanish students. Um, I said, you know, someone could talk to me in Brazilian Portuguese. They could tell me to go to hell and I'd be delighted because I just yeah. love the sound of it. It's a musical yep. language. Yeah. And then, you know, just um, I went with my mom to Ecuador because she had some work there. And she says, come on, mija, let's go. So I accompanied her, um, went back to Japan with one of my tias because she said generously, she's like, I want to give you a graduation gift for your master's. Let's go to Japan. Since you've been there, you'll be our tour guide. So we went back to Japan and on the way back, we went through Beijing and spent some time in Beijing, China, because we had family that was living over there from Bolivia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so cool. just stuff like that, you know. What would you say is like probably one of the, the greatest things that you gain from traveling? Well, that's an excellent question. One of the greatest things that I Because a lot of people say like invest in experiences versus, you know, physical, you know, exactly, you know, property stuff, cars, jewelry, yeah. whatever, like spend your money on traveling. You know? Yeah, I would say that's for sure. I, I agree with that. And I would say it gave me a very rich imagination. I think that it has cultivated me in a in, in me a mind that can imagine all kinds of possibilities. And that translates into how I teach, how I live and move in the world, when I compose a song, even my dreams at night. One of my favorite dreams that I have, it's a recurring dream, is this city that's a mashup or an amalgam of several cities that I've lived and traveled to in my life. So it's cool, I'll be like, it's this, just a city. I don't know what the name of it is, but like I'll be mm. like in in. It's Christina, or how do you yeah, say? Christina. <laughs> yeah, Christina. Yeah, like I'll be like at a sushi restaurant that's so cool, and the vibe is just right, and it's really small, you know. And I'm in, in and that's probably from a memory in Kyoto, in Japan. Mm -hmm. And then in my dream, I'll be like, but you know what? I really want to go to the ocean right now. So, and then I'm like on my favorite beach in Santa Cruz, but it's all in the nice. same town, like in my dream. And it's a yeah. I want to live there. It sounds great. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I know, right? So I think that's important. Because we need creativity and imagination in our times, especially right now. Oh, yeah. It's so and, dark sometimes. And, and probably need, the yeah. appreciation for culture and music and being cool with somebody being different, right? Like exactly. Probably, I would know. say that's probably, that probably, and just in terms of day-to-day -day terms, I think, in ter I think traveling has helped me to decenter myself. I am not at the center of the narrative. Yeah, my story is important. But so is this person's and so is that person's. And also just being from the United States, I don't labor under any kind of lie that we are the greatest nation on earth. Forgive right. me. I'm, I'm not saying we don't have great things about us, but, but, but there are many great places on this earth, right? So 
I, I think that that influenced me greatly in that way. In my fantasy. Awesome. Yeah. Are you ready for Prince? Oh, I'm always ready for Prince. <laughs> Tell me about oh, this one. Oh, yeah. I love this song. Okay, let me hear a little bit of it. I gotta remember. Oh, God, I love this. Is this okay? This is just Prince, his voice, and the piano. Yep. And that reverb. He's got, you know, there's a reverb. Oh, man. Okay, so <laughs> this is super special for me because, okay, lyrically, it's about that space that I think everybody's been in where you've, you don't want to call. You're, you don't want to call. It's over. You know it's over, but you can't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, how come you don't call me? Right? And you know you shouldn't pick up that phone. And and it's that pain of a relationship being over. And probably it's more over for the other person than it is for you. That's that space that, that I remember. Right? And anyway, lyrically, that's what's happening. But I just... This song I first heard in 1983 at a concert, at his concert. Oh, and you've seen him live? Oh, oh my God. Wow. Okay. That's awesome. Luis. You got to tell me about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so check this out. I think it's 1983-ish. I'm probably like 15. He is touring, promoting his 1999 album. This is pre-Purple Rain, the 1999 album, right? Famous mm -hmm. for the song, 1999. And... At back in that time, in the early 80s, the Lloyd Noble in Norman, Oklahoma was the venue. No for, way. No, seriously. Really? Like, I mean, I mean, Sting. I heard Sting there. I heard Cool wow. and the Gang there. I heard the Talking Heads there. Devo. Um, cool, uh, Hall and Oates. Heard Hall and Oates there. And I heard Prince there. And wow. Prince, yes. And Prince, I will never forget this. It was a weeknight because I had begged like to go. I was like, Mom, I got to go to this. And it was my friend Claudia and I who we were both huge fans of Prince. It was a weeknight. It was a rainy night. Um, I think it was in the spring. And um, that place was packed. Yeah. Least, packed, <laughs> packed. That's awesome. And it was a largely, a, you know, people of color. I would say mostly black, African-American Folks were mm -hmm. dressed to the nines. Awesome. And the openers were Vanity Six, one of the bands that he produced, you know, and, uh -huh. and The Time, another band that Prince produced and worked with, Morris Day and The Time, and then Prince. Wow. And we had floor seats. And at that time, you could buy tickets. Floor seats just meant like, have at it, you know, like, yeah. first, first come, come, first serve. serve. Yeah. Okay. And we weaseled our little 15 year old bodies to the front center row <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> i'm so jealous right now the more I, you tell I'm me the more, I'm, the more jealous i am <laughs> i'm jealous of me i'm like damn that was next a thing you're gonna be like, and then we went on stage <laughs> <laughs> right no but but we did we weaseled ourselves there and this song okay okay so you know i love all types of prince songs i was into him you know his controversy album Everything, the really super funky Prince songs, you know, the, you know, the James mm -hmm. Brown references, all that. But, and he'd had that kind of a show up until this moment when he did the song. It was just like, pa, pa, pa. Just, he was a wowing us with his guitar, his piano, his band was wowing us. People were into it. And then it was just like the piano, right? You know, those moments in the performance where it's like, okay, now it's just Prince and his piano and the spotlight. Mm -hmm. And he just, boom. Do, 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 just started playing. and I will never forget that because I just it's it was I just the chords they're very bluesy gospel jazzy it it it, it was revealing really like his musical roots you know gospel jazz blues um that he could just make a song that's just his voice and piano just so soulful um that's Prince. He could do it yeah. all. He could do it all. And it just kind of laid bare for everybody there. It was like, it was very intimate, but it was also just like, damn, this, this man is just uh, an amazing musician and, and songwriter and, and performer and his connection with the music and with us. It was killer. It was, it was amazing. And um, did you know it at the time, how special that moment was, or were you I just kind of just did. like, this is just a concert, you know? No, 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 no. Uh, uh uh like because i was way into prince so okay i i knew how special it was i had no idea that that would 
remain special for my whole life. Yeah. You know, because that that's my concert. That is the concert that I hold as my bar. That, oh, there, okay. And there's only one other concert <laughs> that's gotten close, Luis. You What's get, that? You might be, think this is interesting. Logic. Two really? Week, two, week, two years ago. Do Amphitheater. Yeah. Yes. Wow. I was not expecting Logic. <laughs> no. Let me tell you something. Yeah. The reason being, they're different, different musical styles. Oh, yeah. One thousand percent. Right. Yeah. However, it was Logic's connection with the audience. Yeah. That level of connection that I also felt at that Prince concert. Um, his commitment to the music. His flow and just also, he, you know, I feel like Logic is one of those artists who really not only in his sound um but he lives it he 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 honors his lineage his musical lineage and For he was sure. even talking about it at the concert like he's like it, you know he was referencing tribe called quest and he was referencing um i can't re remember what other hip-hop artists but you want to talk about an introvert though i mean have you ever heard him just speak about like him himself i mean he's just like a big nerd he's into video games right like he used to just play like video games all day in the yes. basement and then he retired because he just wanted to play video games <laughs> i so didn't know now, that that was why he yeah, retired so he retired and now he's on twitch so he just streams oh. like himself like playing video games of course Damn. now he has the money to do that right right but, right, right i mean right. he just feels more comfortable and i think so in hip-hop it's so hard to get accepted too so i don't think yes. he Yes. He has amazing talent, but I don't think that a lot of the artists accepted him for whatever no. reason. You know? I know. I know. Yeah, totally. Exactly. I think he's a brilliant artist and he can improv, man. He can spit rhymes. I mean, I've heard yeah. him. Have you heard him? He yeah. Can, oh, yeah. He, oh. Is yeah. his like lyrical like flow is oh. like, I mean, he can change it up, go fast, go oh, yeah. slow. Like he's very, very talented. Yeah, yeah for sure. I what's, wasn't expecting logic well, compared to Prince, though. <laughs> well, you know what's kind of cool about that, Luis, too, is that I was 15 when I went to that Prince concert, uh -huh. and and my daughter was 15 when we went to the Logic concert together. Oh wow! That's and for cool. her, it was her first concert that she was really just crazy about going to get to see him. She's a big awesome. Logic fan, and she's the one who introduced me to Logic. Okay. My old, my so oldest. she dragged you to the to the concert, well, yeah. or did you already know well, about Logic? She didn't drag me because I wouldn't have paid that money for Logic <laughs> if I didn't yeah. also and, and attend it. I'd be like, hell no! But no, no, we had she had played it a lot for me, and I loved okay. like Black Spider Man and stuff. And she said, "Oh, please, Mama, can we do this?" I was like, oh, "Okay, let's do it," you know. And yeah. so it was kind of cool in the way too that like it was very special because. It's kind of full circle in a way we both are the same age and i knew how much that she was singing every lyric she and her friend who i took they were they knew every lyric and um so yeah and i just remember coming and, and i was like up and down the whole time like just pogo dancing the whole like, ah! nice. <laughs> and, and so i just in my head i was like you know what i don't remember a better concert except for the prince one that so that one yeah. kind of rose to the level of that wow. prince concert yeah for that's me. amazing yeah <laughs> yeah did you with your uh, daughters do you influence them a lot with the music or do you just let them gravitate to whatever they they want naturally both both, both? yeah okay. i always made it a point and i still do to um play all kinds of music that i love and i have a lot of diverse interests in music so especially when they're little i was like you know what this has to be part of their dna um, uh -huh. They need to hear hip hop. They need to hear a tribe called Quest. They need to hear Erica Badu. They need to hear um, Queen Latifah. They need to hear uh, Bossa Nova, Caetano Veloso, um, Antonio Carlos Jobim. They need to hear Chopin, Mozart, yeah, that's Bluegrass. Very cool. And then, of course, they heard me playing. They still hear me every day playing. So, I, I always in my mind, I kind of think that's medicine for them. Even if they're not directly listening and they're doing their, you know, TikTok or whatever, <laughs> uh -huh. um, it's, it's in the air. But they influence me too, and I love to hear what they're into. That's and very cool. So that's are they into music, that. like playing oh, instruments? Yeah. Uh, well, um, they st both played piano for a while, but then it got to this point where they were like, "We don't want to practice anymore. This feels like drudgery." I was like, "Okay, I'm not going to force you to do this." I was debated. I was like, "Should I force them?" I thought, "No, I don't want to do that. That's my thing, but it may not be theirs. My job yeah. is to help them find their passion." And so that's, so they don't, they don't, uh, my oldest is really into photography though. She puts her creativity into photography and my youngest, she played uke for a while, ukulele. She was great, excellent ear. 
and she's she's not playing anymore right now but yeah okay tell me a little bit about what you do now because uh reading your bio you said that uh you, you incorporate um i guess I w- i'll let you sort of you, you could probably speak to it better than i can but you just your teaching strategies and and how do you incorporate you know just the the music and everything mm-hmm. that we've been talking to yeah. about you know up to this point tell me tell me a little bit about what you do now yeah so i teach at ou and i uh, teach 1000 and 2000 level spanish language courses so they're uniform like departmental classes in the sense that you know it's the same syllabus for all students who take this class it's just the very beginning and most of the students who are in there it's they're required to be in there they haven't elected to take spanish they have to have a language requirement So they're like, well, let's just do Spanish, right? So, you know, you have varying levels of interest (laughs) um, initially. So I'm always... Little do they know that they're going to get a rock star for a teacher. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's sweet of you to say. I don't know about rock star, but I think one thing that they cannot deny when they finish my class is that I have exposed them in a way that's exciting and I've been passionate about exposing them to culture. Mm. And so I do that in a number of ways. Um... Right. This semester is my first semester not teaching in in person. I'm doing it via Zoom, but I've still tried to incorporate this. But in my in-person classes, I started making a point to regularly have us, maybe it'd be like on Fridays, but we'd have um, a dance circle where I would teach them. I'd give them a little background, let's say, of merengue. I said, uh-huh. where's merengue originally from? And we'd learn, depending on the level of Spanish, because I teach 1,000 and 2,000 levels, sometimes it would be all in English, sometimes it would be in Spanglish, sometimes it would be Spanish. De donde es el merengue, right? La República Dominicana. Um, what does it sound like? Okay, now what does it feel like? And we'd get up and form a circle. And, and you know, of course, some people would be like, oh, Lord, I've never moved my hips in my life or not since I was a baby. <laughs> and we'd talk about, hey, you know what? Just for this next 10 minutes, like right, that we're dancing, just try and imagine that you don't care how you look. It's just about how you feel. And you can even laugh at ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I'd also emphasize to them how important dancing is in our cultures, in Latinx cultures. And for those guys that thought they were too macho to dance, I'd say, and you know, y- y'all, I mean, men who can dance in Latinx cultures are, you know, they're fine. I mean, that's a catch. Yeah. So <laughs> You're the man, it's, man. Not, it's not a feminine <laughs> or something, right? Yeah, not at all. So, we, you know, we just, we, and we'd have fun. We'd have so much fun. And then the next week it'd be bachata. Okay, we're doing bachata. Where is it from? How do, how do we do it? Let's do it. Get up. Awesome. Boom. Then the next week it would be salsa. And, okay. it, and even last semester, I remember I had a football player from OU who loved it when we would do dancing. I mean, he was more excited than I was, which I don't even thought was possible. <laughs> he would just, he was like, yes. And he, um, and one day he's like, can we teach you something? I was like, sure. And so we did, I think it was, it was Cuban shuffle. Yeah. Yeah, we, we did that, you know. And so. And that and also um, inviting students who are from Latin America or Latinos, you know, from the United States to my classes to talk about different lived experiences. I've made that a part of my classes. Okay. And I will incorporate videos that I find on YouTube or, you know, fragments of documentaries so that they can really um, get an exposure to our diverse lived experiences. Of wow, that's people. awesome. So it's like multimedia to like yeah. the next level. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. And, and that keeps me interested as, as an yeah. instructor because I'm always learning too. That's the key, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and, and invariably, you know, my students are diverse and they come from different backgrounds. Um, so it's interesting to see the kind of connections they'll make with this stuff. You know, yeah. or sometimes it's something is a revelation for them. They've never heard of this. Or I remember like my one girl who she's from Oklahoma, but her parents are Nigerian. And I remember showing her Afro-Cuban rumba, uh, Afro-Cuban rumba. I showed her some a couple dancing. She's like, this is just like our Nigerian music, you know, mm-hmm. and like. And, and so it's, it's really interesting to see or like when we will learn about flamenco music. I remember some of my students from that have Indian heritage from India, they'd be like, Oh, why does this this why does flamenco dancing look so similar to some of our North Indian classical music? Well, it's because You're it's from right. the, wow. It's because I never, it, I never thought about that. It's because yeah. flamenco comes from the 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 gitanos, the Romaji people who migrated from northern India thousands of years oh, ago. Wow. So there okay. is a connection there. Right? Now, so is it merengue or salsa? I want to say it's merengue. 
and you tell me if it's wrong or not. I thought I heard that that the steps are because of the slaves and the shackles that were on their feet, and that's why you that know, step is kind of like that. Is that true or not? You know, I don't, you know? I don't know, uh, Luis. I remember Greg Hallman telling me that. Yeah, I okay. remember our wonderful friend, uh, musician Greg Hallman, and it it makes sense though. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean. I mean, that's the other thing that that I also try and expose my students to. It's like Latin America is a product of um, colonialism, settler colonialism of, of the North Atlantic slave trade. Latin America is black. Latin America is indigenous. Mm -hmm. Latin America is European. Latin America is Asian too, you know? And um, so I also try to expose them to, to, to really learning, you know, why is it that we're so diverse, awesome. the history. Cool. Vamos a darle gracias a la vida. Gracias a la vida. <laughs> yeah, this is a great, I mean, what are, can you say? Thank you to life. This is a song. Um, this is one of those songs that I discovered on an album in my cousin's al album collection in La Paz, Bolivia. Uh, cool. Yeah, and I thought, who is this woman on the cover of this album? She looks so, like, has such a presence. Mercedes Sosa. I think she passed a few years ago now. They called her La Voz, The Voice, because her voice is so was so capable of power and then just so much tenderness and everything in between and mm -hmm. she was also one of these artists who was she was exiled from argentina for a while because she was part of this movement of artists and activists who were protesting against the military uh, repressive dictatorships and the killings and the disappearings of people you know it was uh, and and she was very vocal about it sometimes she would put it in her lyrics in a in a maybe like a poetic way right to kind of but she was exiled and and uh, was out of argentina for a while and, but i heard, i love this because the lyric she didn't write this this was written by another woman who had a huge influence on that movement of nueva canción violeta parra a chilena okay a chilena um who she wrote this song and um Violeta Parra traveled all throughout her native Chile and she really wanted to go to the pueblitos in Chile and, and go to the indigenous, the Mapuche. Mapuche is one of the biggest indigenous groups in Chile. Pueblos and find out their stories and find out what were their songs and instruments. And um, So this song she wrote um, towards the end of her life. She actually took her life, sadly, Violeta oh, Parra. Wow. Yeah, and this is one of the last songs she wrote. Um, but it's a beautiful song and, and, you know, every verse says gracias to something like gracias a la vida because it has given me el corazón, the heart, my mm -hmm. heart. It's given me la marcha de mis pies cansados. You know, it's given me the, 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 the get up and go of my feet, even though they be tired, they've gone. Through. Wow, that's so beautiful, right? Right? Yeah, that's yeah. an awesome line. Yeah, that's awesome. I know. And at the end, she's like, the last verse is like, and it's given me joy and it's given me great sorrow um but in, in the end um this song that i sing is my song and it's your song it's it's all of our songs mm -hmm. it's just a very profound song i also sang this at one of my dearest friends weddings she wanted me to sing this um so i sang it and um, wow it sounds like it would be like super difficult to sing because it's I mean, your your voice is basically the the main instrument in this yeah. song, right? I mean, oh yeah. The, the guitar is like you know comes second, at least when I listen to it. Sure. Well, and and the, and then Armando and I do this also in our in our gigs and stuff. But we we our arrangement is a little more. Um, well, he plays the bombo, which is a, um, it's a percussion instrument from that area, the Andes in Argentina, Bolivia, and and I play the guitar a little more a little more emphasis on the guitar. Cueca rhythm, okay. six eight rhythm, tuck, 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 it's a rhythm and a dance, the cueca. Um, so it's a little more, it's a different feel, but the, okay. but still, you know, the, you're right. The, the voice and the lyrics are super important in the song. So. And it's it sounds like sad to me. Does does it ever happen to you when you're singing a sad song that you feel like crying oh because you're gosh, so in tune yes, with the song? Yes, <laughs> yes. You know, a song that does that for, to me is uh, I don't know if you know this one, but it's. Alfonsina y el mar. It's it's called Alfonsina y and the ocean, and uh, it was written in tribute to a writer. Um, oh my God! Why am I spacing on the name of the writer? 
Anyway, it was written for a writer who was from uh, Argentina, who also took her life, which is very sad, but it was written posthumously. Alfonsina Storni, of course, that was her name, Alfonsina Storni. Okay. She was a poet. But her dear friends found one of her last poems. And so they incorporated that in that song, Alfonsina El Mar. And every time I sing that one, it's a beautiful song. It's like really honoring of her humanity, but it's also tragic, you know? Yeah. Um, so, like I said, you know, I think that joy, the kind of joy that we have to cultivate cannot also deny the sadness that we have. That's part of life. It's part of la vida. Yeah. So, oh yeah. One thing I always ask the, the guests is to tell me something that most people don't know about them. So what would be something that most people don't know about you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see. That's an interesting question. Most people don't. Um, hmm. Wow, you put me on the spot, Luis. That's a good question. <laughs> and you, you need to have, you're, you're, you're like a, you, you gotta, you should be like Oprah or something or like, you know. There you go. <laughs> um, and you get a car and you get a car. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that's a deep question. I don't really know. I would say probably, um, well, I like to binge watch stuff on Netflix. <laughs> I think so, here's what I think. I think sometimes th people think that I'm so intense because I am. I'm a Scorpio. I'm a triple Scorpio. My my moon, sun, and earth signs are all in Scorpio. Um, so I'm pretty intense. Like I like to get to the deep stuff, you know. Um, uh -huh. But I like frivolous and silly. Because here's the thing for me, silly and frivolous is deep also. Like that's <laughs> it's liberating. Like I love... Um, but but the stuff that I love tends to be deeper on Netflix too. But I love Shit's Creek. It's totally silly. Yeah. <laughs> totally absurd. <laughs> I love Pose, nice. you know, on Netflix. But anyway, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I really don't. It's hard for me to kind of say what other people might be surprised to know about me. I, I don't know. I don't have a good sense of yeah. that, I guess. <laughs> I got it. I put you on the spot. <laughs> you were surprised. You, <laughs> you were surprised to learn that I was into R and B and hip hop. Yeah, yeah. So for that's sure. inter maybe yeah. maybe people will be surprised at the diversity of my musical loves yeah because when i think about you i think about um uh, like gloria stefan you know <laughs> that's kind of like you well, know you're, you're into all the latin rhythms and, sure you know especially her album mi tierra when she did that Ooh, with all the traditional love stuff one. like love that one. you know that's kind of when i think about sort of the stuff that you sing or maybe yeah. the type of stuff that you might listen yeah, that's to true. you know that's, but true, that's probably yeah. putting you in a box yeah <laughs> you know, you're probably like wait i'm listening logic right now <laughs> <laughs> exactly Exactly. That's very cool. So tell me then, uh, as far as like teaching, where do you see that going in the future? Because, you know, everybody's thinking, unless you're going to be a doctor, unless you're going to be a lawyer, like maybe you, it doesn't make sense to go to, you know, higher education. Do you believe in that? Or do you think that, you know, because right now entrepreneurship is like huge, right? right. Like you want to be, you know, a developer, you know, make an app, make a your own business like you can totally do that with the internet but, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know tell me what you think about that are, are you saying like in, in terms of it, given what the context is that you don't think the 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 thing that some people are saying to, for people not to go to college or in terms of professionally for me in terms of no no for for people in general right oh, like okay. because they're saying you know if you're going to be an entrepreneur or mm -hmm. an artist or mm -hmm. let's say you're going to be uh, I don't know, a radio DJ or right. something like you don't necessarily have to go to college and, gotcha. you know, be in debt and do yes. all this. Well, I think what that, do you think about that? OK, gotcha. I think there's great validity to that. I mean, I, I, I'm open to those that conversation. In fact, I have that very conversation with my oldest um, okay. and I'm not pushing her to go to college. I mean, I, you know, I've kind of evolved as I've gone along as, as a mom, as a parent. She is passionate about photography. She has mm -hmm. started her own photography business where she's doing awesome. portraits and, you know, and she's she's starting to have a business mind about it. And she talks to me about that. She's thinking, maybe I do want to go. Maybe I don't. Maybe I want to do a little bit of community college. Not sure. So we're mm -hmm. having those conversations, you know. Um, so and I and I agree. I mean, my gosh, unless we get an administration and policies that are going to forgive student loan debt. And, and we, yeah. unless we make college accessible, affordable, if not free, 
I mean, you know, I can't, I, I'm not mad at people that to say, you know, yeah, I'm sorry, that's not for me. If you're going to be like a, a film director or right. something, right? Like you probably have better chances of doing your own thing. Exactly. And maybe you can blow up on YouTube or maybe you can just, you know, go intern somewhere for free for a while. Right. And then, you know, so I don't know, that's kind of the argument recently is like, yeah. unless you're going to be a doctor or a scientist or engineer or something that actually requires that, then maybe because of the internet, you know, you, you have more tools accessible to be whatever you want to be. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I think it's exciting. I think it's awesome that, you know, that there's so many possibilities and there's like yeah. career possibilities that didn't exist, you know, 10 years ago. And you can even make up your own thing, you know, <laughs> the pressure with Latinos, though, it's always like, you know, your parents always want you to go to college and they sure. want you to be successful and go into these more traditional careers. Right. right. I mean, I still <laughs> have that in me of like, yes, Mija, I totally support you in your business, but, you know, get that college degree because, you know, for whatever, you know, you might be some point in your life where your business isn't going well or something. And at least that will give you more options as a job candidate, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So I don't know how true that's going to be going forward or not, but yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right. Tell me about Los Lobos. Oh, I love Los Lobos. <laughs> this song, Free Up, Free Up. Um, this is, I love the line where it says, when it comes my time, you won't find me crying. Because when I'm gone, everything will be fine. It's just a very... This is awesome. I've never had a guest that can sing. You know, maybe we should just do the karaoke version. <laughs> well, <laughs> and then just the guest sings the song. Yeah. Well, be, be, before, uh, before I talk about the song, I have to kind of get into it. You know what I mean? That's yeah, why. So yeah. forgive me for... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. I just never had that. I was like, man, I just want to do the karaoke version yeah, of the right. podcast. <laughs> yeah, I just, I love this song because um, this came out, like, I think in 2006. They've made so many albums since then and before that they've been do doing it for decades Los Lobos mm -hmm. um you know I just love this groove because to me it's I mean you, you probably know if you've heard Los Lobos and they're capable of so many sounds you know they can go from you know, just a hard rock and roll song to like something that's more Grateful Dead bluesy to like they'll pick up their jaranas or their guitarrones and do something from like Central Mexico in Spanish you know but I love this one because to me it feels like kind of like laid back. Uh, we don't need to prove anything to anybody, Los Lobos. It feels a little bit like East LA to me, where they're from. Mm -hmm. um, the, the chorus, free, uh, it feels bluesy and gospel. And it's just a very liberating type of message. Like, you know what? Free your mind. You know, we worry about, he, he's talked about all these things that we're worried about, which we, is very human. But ultimately, you know, just give it up, let it go. And um, I have a really special story about Los Lobos. So Los Lobos, I've always loved. Um, I've always identified very much with them because, you know, they grew up in East LA, but their parents were, were from Mexico, um, almost all the members of Los Lobos. So they, they, you know, they very much have what a lot of us, what I may imagine you can relate to, to an extent too, I don't know, I don't, is, is, you know, you feel identified with cultures in the United States, but you also feel very identified with you, in your yeah, case, Mexican heritage, 1, right? Exactly, exactly. And I always, you know, when you're growing up in this culture in here, I always felt that, you know, with my Bolivian heritage and also the United States connection. And it was cool to find artists who would embody that and not shy away from it. They didn't have to choose either one. And just, um, and just being hell of mus musicians, beautiful musicians. Mm -hmm. um, but my story is that, so I, I met them briefly at after a show that they did at Kane's Ballroom in Tulsa. But there you go, making me jealous again. <laughs> you dropping. have all these cool stories. Yeah, well, so, so we're hanging out backstage. <laughs> <laughs> no, but check this out. This is, the, this is the kicker here. That was just like one of those, we were at Kane's Ballroom in Tulsa, and it was easy to go out up afterwards. They were, you know, packing up their gear. They're very humble people. They really are. They were down to earth. And, you know, shook their hands. And it was a great show. Kane's Ballroom is a wonderful venue. You know, they did their anthemic version of Volver, 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 you know. Awesome. Which is beautiful. And that was back in, like, the 90s. But then a couple of years ago, this was just, this was, like, one of my favorite memories of all time. 
So a couple of years ago, I'm in Santa Cruz. I had gone back a couple summers ago to Santa Cruz just to visit. And I also had a job in Oakland, California, a couple of hours up the road from Santa Cruz, doing um, directing a children's youth uh, presentation of Coco. A theater okay. presentation of, of Coco, no, and which was in itself of itself very cool. It was such a beautiful experience. But question I'll, for you before you continue, sorry to interrupt. Did no. you cry during Coco? Or oh not? my God! Is the Pope, I cried. Is the Pope <laughs> Catholic? Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Right, like once that abuelita, oh, no. man, I had to cry. Right, jeez, like, that is such a beautiful <laughs> movie. Oh yeah, when the abuelita at the end, when she's oh my yeah. god, that yeah. beautiful. All right, sorry to interrupt. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, we'll have to have another show about Coco. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, no. I'm so I'm staying in this hotel. It's a week before I have to go to Oakland. I'm staying in this hotel in Santa Cruz, and um, and I'm and it's ha it's happy hour in the hotel, and I'm going and I left my room. I'd already I'd already checked in the day before, and I'm going to my car, and I see Louis Perez, one of the I mean, Louis Perez and David Hidalgo are like Lennon and McCartney to me. You know, they've mm -hmm. put, those two have put out so many beautiful songs. So I see Louis Perez checking in. Like this guy that looked kind of like had his flannel shirt on and his LA ball cap. And I go, are you Louis Perez? <laughs> and he said, yeah, yeah, I am. Just really, I go, oh, I go, hi, I'm Christina. I said, my name's Christina Otis. I, I, I love your music. Oh, wow, you know. I go, I'm a musician too. He's like, oh, really? What do you play? So we just started striking out. And he's like, I go, what are you doing here? He said, uh, well, we have a private gig in Santa Cruz that we're, we're, check, we're checking in for. I go, oh, cool. And uh, he, he said, where do you live? I said, Oklahoma. He said, oh, well, you know, we come through there a lot, Tulsa and Oklahoma City. And I saw them in Norman too. I've seen them many times. Santa Cruz, oh, California, wow. Norman, Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and he said, yeah, okay, well, we'll see you then. I was like, okay, okay, great. Bye. I went back to my room and I was like, <laughs> okay, if that wasn't enough, so I had to leave my room again to go to, out to my car to get something. This was about a half an hour later. I go allegedly, out. Uh, allegedly, decent, <laughs> decent, this kid. Uh, and then I go and I go back and I walk past the happy hour, and all of the members of Los Lobos are sitting there drinking and just chilling, and they were the only awesome. ones. And I was like, I did one of those like. <laughs> oh my god okay so i go over there and i go oh my and no no i go back to my hotel room and get my guitar i had my guitar with me and i said i just had this it was like i didn't even think of it i was like you know what i gotta go introduce myself i gotta tell them how much they've meant to me and then if they'll have me do it i will play for them one of my originals not as a way for them to say oh that's great or not to doesn't have the, i don't need their evaluation on it I just, as a way of saying thank you, because it was one wow, of my that original. That takes a lot of guts. It did that take guts, guts when I think that. about it, because I was <laughs> don't think I wasn't nervous. But it was one yeah. of those like intuitive things. Luis was like, I got to do this. I may, may never yep. get this it's chance. Like now or never. Exactly. Right? Now or never. So I yeah. come back with my little guitarrita. <laughs> and, um, and my daughters were with me. One of my daughters came with me. The other one, she regrets it to this day. She's like, nah. And she was like on TikTok or something like that, you know. But the younger oh, one was no. like, I'll go with you, mommy. The younger one. So she witnessed it. So we go, and I'm with my guitarra, and there's David Hidalgo and Cesar Rosales and all of them just chilling. And I'm like, oh, hi, um, my name is Christina. Um, God, like such a I happen to have my guitar here. <laughs> uh. <laughs> no, but I, I just said, you know, I, I, y'all have meant so much to me. Um, I'm a Bolivian heritage, United States heritage. I've always identified with you. I love your music, and I'm also a musician. Um, so I just want to thank you. And they were like, oh, well, that's cool. You know, they were real laid back. I, I, go, I heard you were in town for a private show. And they're like, yeah, we're playing tonight at a private party. And because um, the other dude that I'd run into, Luis Perez, wasn't there. He was the one in the group that I guess he was up, up meditating or doing yoga or something. They say he's like the spiritual one of the group. Uh, but, okay. any, but anyway, so I'm like, hey, I go, y'all might not want this. And listen, I don't, if you say no, no worries. I said, you might be tired. You might be just like, Listen, we just need a little second to ourselves. But if you will have me to do it, I really would love to play my song Corazón Bailando, Dancing Heart. It's one of my one of my original songs in Spanish, um, just as a way to say thank you to you all. Um, do you happen to have your guitar right now? I don't. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I was going to put you on the spot. All right, <laughs> let us know. <laughs> but, Show us what you got. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but yeah, no, I played it. I played it for 
them and they were, and what was so cool, Luis, and oh, by the way, they were saying, they said, yeah, sure, let's hear it. They were like, cool about it. You know, I thought because they could have been like, no, mm, we got to play our gig and, you know, just bye. <laughs> but sure, they didn't. Yeah. They didn't. And so um, I played and I remember and I looked up in my song and and I saw them just going like this. They're holding their little beers and bobbing. Oh, to, wow. I mean, to have your <laughs> idols and people you admire, you know, like since you were That's a kid amazing. to just be bopping to your, you know, grooving to your, your music. Yeah. <laughs> I would be so nervous. I would be missing all kinds of riffs and stuff. Well, like I would be like, <laughs> I don't know if I was missing riffs or not, but I got through it. And, um, and I, but I, and I, cause I remember in my head going, don't let your nerves make you forget this moment. I remember thinking mm -hmm. that in my head in, as I was singing and playing, so take a mental, picture. take a mental picture. So I looked up and looked at them and stuff like that. And then I finished and they were like, yeah, they were like, I remember David Hidalgo, he goes, man, can I steal some of those guitar chords from you? And we all just laughed because there's a lot of jazz chords in there. Uh -huh. And uh, and he's like, man, what, where do you live? Like, what do you do? And so we just started chatting, you know, and wow. and they it turns out they knew like about the charango and the Bolivian music. You know, they're like, oh, yeah, like they've even used the charango in a lot of their songs and stuff. And of course, well, at the end of La Bamba, it goes into like this, uh, like traditional Jarocho, like, Veracruzano yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah oh, totally. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they, they're into it. So that was like one of my all time cherished memories. It was just like <laughs> I was like, wow. Talking about being an introvert. <laughs> yeah, and, and right. Get the guts to do this. Wow, that's amazing. But that's what I mean. Like, I think there's just, like I said, I've always pushed myself. Even though I'm yeah. shy, I, there's this, I, thank God, for good or for bad, I think there are moments in my life where it's just been like, dale, go, do it. It's almost mm -hmm. like it's not even a thought, it's just an instinctive thing. Yeah, I do that to myself all the time. And I'm just like, what's the worst that can happen? They say no. Exactly. <laughs> like, why, why are you right. going to tell yourself no? Like, just do it, right? I like, like if that, I'm going yes. for, you know, a new position or whatever, it's like, why, you know, cut yourself? Let them cut yourself. You that, know, that don't is, do it to yourself. I you love know? it. I love it. Yeah, yeah, you have to. You have to. Tell me about Celia Cruz. Ooh, Celia. She is la reina, la guarachera. You know, de Cuba. Um, Celia. This is one of her all time jams, oh too, by the God. way. Yeah. Kimbara. Kimba, Such a fun track. Kimbara, kumbara, kimba, kimba. Well, I, this is the, this is such a great dance jam, and it is such a beautiful musical track. This is one that I will definitely um, expose my students to when we learn about salsa and we learn about Celia Cruz and we get up and they learn to sing Kimbara, Kimbara, Kumba, Kimbamba. That's a tongue twister for them. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's yeah. a tongue twister for Spanish speakers. Kimbara, Kimbara. Mm -hmm. And um, so they learn to salsa and I, I teach them about salsa itself. A lot of them think it's from Latin America. They don't know that it was, it is from Latin America, but it's also from New York City. It's from the collaborations of musicians from New York. You know, it's about the diaspora of Caribbean musicians from Cuba, Puerto Rico, um, being in New York and those beautiful fusions. Again, you know, music transcends mm -hmm. boundaries. It's about Africa. It has a lot of West African roots in the clave rhythm, in the style of singing and the call and response. So we learn about some of that. Then we dance it, we get their salsa on. And I also teach them about Celia because Celia, um, you know, she was a wonderful musician. She, I mean, you really listen to her and I know people think of her as a flamboyant personality, which she was as a performer, you know, she was a wonderful performer. But musically mm -hmm. too, she had, I mean, she was in the pocket with like her musical vocal improvisation. You know, talk about like improving and, and spitting rhymes. Like her genre is not hip hop, but she could right. improvise, and especially back in yeah, the day. Yeah, she did that all the time, like going back and forth with the band. Oh, yeah, right? like just totally. Live. The right? chorus, yeah. and then she would, you know, over the top improvise. Mm -hmm. And so I have so much respect for her. And she was an Afro Latina, you know, a Black Latina. And she was proud of that before it was really popular to be proud. Still not that popular to be proud of that or as visible, but yeah. getting more so. And so I think that's important to also underscore to my students who are learning Spanish, because I want them to know about the different identities we hold in the Latin world um, and the stories that have been silenced, you know. So I just love Celia. This is such an emblematic song of the Fania All-Stars, you know, Willy Colon, Johnny Pacheco, Celia Cruz. When I heard your um, interview with Greg Hallman, 
I just smiled because I know, you know, <laughs> Greg loved that era too. Back in at OU when we were all there. Yeah, and, he lived that. Oh that, that yeah. Guy, like, He's especially totally going living. back and forth to New York right? and stuff like that, right? you know, and then starting bands around that music. And exactly. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. And so when I discovered, I think I probably discovered her like in college. Um, I remember some Colombian friends that were really into salsa and they were even into like, not just the Colombian salsa, but like, you know, the roots and stuff. And they turned me on to Celia um, mm -hmm. and just like at the parties, you know, learning to dance it. Um, it's just, it's such a beautiful Ex musical expression and and said so, yeah yeah and it's, i was gonna say if this doesn't put you in a happy mood then we can't be friends <laughs> exactly <laughs> then you have no pulse like there's there's something <laughs> wrong with you <laughs> there is no pulse yeah you're not living no but yeah and i love this song too because it's um it's very like you can hear the roots the west african roots in this song like you said you've got the chorus and then you've got her the call and response and even celia's vocal tone that kind of nasal, it's very Cubano, mm -hmm. and that's very emblematic of a lot of West African musical styles, which is where a lot of Cuban music is, is rooted in, right? So I think that's yeah. important to see all those cultural layers and feel it and, you know, hear it. Um, salsa is a beautiful fusion of those things. So, awesome. yeah. Cool. I love it. I love the track. Now tell me, so one thing I see, uh, among you know latinos growing up now is that some of the the kids are forgetting spanish right mm. like it's not a, because now like you know these future generations you know speak english in the household probably more so than you know when they were growing up and and now they're forgetting spanish tell me something that they can do to continue that legacy and continue the traditions and you know speaking spanish and everything that comes with that yeah i mean i think what, music what would be a suggestion my suggestion is music if, if you like music okay i think i think well i think i think you should find something that you already are into in your in you know that like that you find out about in english like maybe you're into sports okay so go look up information about you know football or something or, or like or any of the major news outlets right all like you could go to Univision or you could go to BBC Mundo, right? And they always have a sports section. Start going with something that you're already passionate about. Maybe enter the language that way. Music is something that most people connect with in some way, right? So find, mm -hmm. you know, start looking to, listening to Spanish language artists. Look up the lyrics. Teach yourself some of these lyrics. Even before you know what the meaning of it, of it is, you can read it, you can learn it. Then you start listening for the meaning, looking up the meaning. Um, I think that's a good entryway, you know? Okay. I really do. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. So you're saying uh, just getting used to listening to it, mm -hmm. uh, that's a, like a gateway into learning I it? Is that kind so. of what you tell your students? Oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I mean, that exposure to it. And then also finding out about, you know, the lived experiences of Latinx people around you, being curious, being open-minded. Um, yeah, I mean, I even have that situation with my daughters. I speak to them in Spanish, mostly, mm -hmm. sometimes Spanglish. Some... Do you have an all-Spanish rule at home no, or no? No, and, no. And, and I've never had that. And it's interesting. I have friends who do have that. I never had that because I found it didn't work for me. It felt too forced. Like it felt, mm -hmm. and frankly, sometimes I would, as a single parent, I would just be so tired sometimes. So if I waited for them to tell me what they needed to tell me in Spanish, <laughs> like, be there all day. I, I want to go to bed. Okay. But, um, but, um, so, and I also just felt like, you know, I, I just want to surround them with it. And like mm -hmm. I said, you know, along with different kinds of music, I've surrounded them with Spanish language music amongst other kinds of music. And I speak to them in Spanish. So my oldest recently said to me very recently, she said, you know, I sometimes wonder like if I'm not as in touch with my culture as I should be. I said, what do you mean, mija? And she's like, well, I don't know if I feel Latinx or Latino or Hispanic or not. And like, you know, in her case, her father is Guatemalan. So she has Guatemalan okay. heritage. She has Bolivian heritage, United States heritage. I said, I think you are more in touch with it than you realize. I said, um, and I reminded her of all the instruments she knew the names of, the charango, the siku. I said, that's our Bolivian heritage. I reminded her that I cook Bolivian rice almost every night of our lives <laughs> mm -hmm. because I grew up on Bolivian rice every night. Bolivianos eat a lot of rice. I said, you know, that's part of your DNA. I said, um, I said, you don't speak it so much to me, but you understand everything. Um, you hear, you hear it every day in the music that I play. Um, 
the way that your abuela, you know, their abuela is a huge part of their life. Her, okay, the way she, awesome. you know what I mean? So she was like, I guess you're right. And I think she was thinking more of the language though. She was starting to feel like, wow, I should practice speaking it more. And so she's yeah, trying to do yeah. that more. And so I'm trying, I'm encouraging her, you know, both yeah, of them. Yeah, that's, I see that just, you know, and it, and it's just because, you know, uh, most of the people now that I guess with kids, you know, kids at that age, they're more comfortable with English, right? They probably grew up here and stuff. For sure, so for sure. It's just, you know, a natural progression but absolutely I, I still think we should fight to keep all the traditions and everything alive and yeah you know make them be aware hey you've got this total other side of you yes. that is also part of you exactly you know? no i think you're so right i mean my way is i'm I, there's room for all of it right there's room you have you should um know that part of yourself and honor that part of yourself and, and also the part of you that likes to speak in english or spanglish you know what i mean mm -hmm. like i'm not a purist as far as that, okay. you know what I mean? Like, I know some people that are like, oh, exigeles, you know, tell them they can only speak to you in Spanish. I'm like, but that's not all <laughs> of who they are. That's part of who right. they are. You know what I mean? Right. That's why I love Spanglish. Yeah. Because yeah. it's like. Tell me about your songwriting. Well, um, I first saw first. How do you get inspired? How do you start you, all, everything? Yeah, you know, um, I started, the first song I ever wrote was when I was probably like, 14 or 15 on the guitar it was an instrumental tune called dandelions on fire um and i was influenced a lot by i think it was i don't know i was listening to all kinds of stuff i even talked about pat metheny and jazz guitarists and michael hedges acoustic but um mm -hmm. i don't know you know i've probably written about 10 songs in my life that have come that i could really call them songs i fiddled around i have passages from other songs but that i want to put on an album and that's something that one of my dreams that I want to do soon is get these 10 songs on an album. Some of them are in English. Shout out Ricardo. Shout out Ricardo. <laughs> I know, right? Exactly. <laughs> Aris recording. Um, yep. <laughs> he's wonderful. But I have, and some in Spanish and some in Spanglish and some are instrumental. And I don't know, they've just, I've never really been disciplined about it. Luis, I'm disciplined about playing. Like I'll play okay. every day and I make sure I, like, you know, I'm especially like, you know, like I have a whole repertoire of a lot of songs that are not originals, but that I don't ever want to forget, right? That mm -hmm. range from like bossa to like gracias a la vida to like blues to like how come you don't call me anymore, my arrangement on the guitar. And so I practice those. And I also work on my originals. And sometimes originals just make their way through. I start getting an idea musically or I'm driving. Like I, I wrote one this summer called um, Cumbia de mi voz, the cumbia of my voice. I was driving to go pick up my my oldest child. She uh, she was with her friend, and I don't know why it came then. I don't maybe it just happened to come then. But I started thinking about this cumbia rhythm, and it and and I thought about the phrase "calladitas son más bonitas, no se enojen, señoritas." And I thought about those <laughs> messages we got growing up as little girls: mm -hmm. "Be quiet. Your place is to be pretty and be quiet." And how I've blown that out of the water in so many ways in my life and as a mother and how I, it's the opposite that I want to do with the, the students that I teach, whether they be yeah. female or male. Be you. Don't let mm -hmm. people silence you. So I, the song just came out. Calladitas son más bonitas, no se enojen, señoritas. Calladitas son más bonitas, no se enojen, señoritas. Pues ya no más, ya nadie me calla, tengo mi voz y voy a usarla. Ya no bebo de ese veneno, guerrera soy y me pertenezco. Oh, poco a poco nos damos cuenta, hasta que un día se nos revelan todas las formas que ellos quisieron hacernos menos, que nos hirieron. Ya no más, ya nadie me calla. Tengo mi voz y voy a, voy a usarla. And on and on. But um, it, Wow, that's too cool. Yeah. That's awesome. So you took that saying and you flipped it. I flipped it. And yeah, that's awesome. I get obsessed once I start with a song. Because once it, it's like this little semillita that works, it starts blooming. And then it's mm -hmm. like all I can think about, you know, and like, Oh, is it dinner time? Hold on, mis mis hijas. <laughs> Hold on. It's, it's like we're hungry. I'm like, good for make ramen or something. And because I just want to keep working on it, you know, uh -huh. until it kind of takes That's shape. Cool. And then you got to, even though it's your own song, you have to internalize it. Like, it it kind of takes a shape, but 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 you have to keep working with it so that so that it, it's mm, it's just an extension of you, right? Cause it, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I love that process. 
What about the melody piece of it? How does the, the melody come into play? I don't know. It just kind of organically. It doesn't, okay. it's not even, I, I, I'm not very, um, I wish I was more like I could explain it better, but I think it just comes just like my daughters harmonize naturally together. Like those, one of them starts singing a line, the other one just harmonizes perfectly. One of my favorite wow. sounds, by the way, to hear my daughters cool. harmonizing. Um, but it's, it can be on your album. <laughs> yes, because it's like that. It's, it's, it's this kind of like, um, process, uh, that is beyond rational thought mm -hmm. you know it comes from another place and you're just the cha like channel that. for it you know and it, so you've told me a, a few of your song titles and they all have really cool titles thank you you know like what do you say corazón bailando, corazón bailando. yeah cumbia de, mi voz. cumbia de mi voz um i got dandelions on fire uh That's cool. i've got um they could oh. almost be like bands, like name of bands, right? like yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. Lines on fire. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I remember my friend named that for me because we were in high school, and I go, I don't know what to call this. What do you think? And he was like, "Dandelions on fire." It just sounds like trippy wow. or something. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but, um, that's awesome. But anyway, and then another one is um, "Don't Look Away." I wrote that one last summer, um, summer before this, I think, as in response to all the migrants coming to this country and uh, the inhumanity. Um, to the to to our migrant brothers and sisters, and it's called "Don't Look Away," mm -hmm. and it's about that. Um, Don't look away. Dan was on fire. Those are some of them. Cumbia de vivos, corazón bailando. Oh, um, los árboles llevan mi canción. That's one. I, wow. That's one I wrote in Guadalajara. Actually, I wrote the music for that, and my friend Jose Antonio wrote the the lyrics. For that okay. One. Yeah. So. Cool. Um, yeah. Very cool song titles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let's talk about D'Angelo now. Ooh. Oh my God, I love this song. This song <laughs> starts off with that very deep um, string intro, right? Cellos. Um, okay, so you you exposed me to this song because you told me, I remember, because I love D'Angelo. I was into D'Angelo with Brown Sugar, that album back uh -huh. in the day. So when the album came out, and I'm always posting like oh, yeah, artists you're always, that are like when their album drops, I it's love like, hey, that. go check out, you know? Right? I know. And I remember <laughs> yeah. we were talking and stuff, and I think you're like, hey, have you heard uh, Black Messiah? I was like, no. You're like, you need to check it out. And so mm -hmm. I did right away. And um, and so I always loved D'Angelo. I loved his Brown Sugar album. I love every song on that. And and I had, but I hadn't really heard him since then. Like I hadn't really. I mean, I was into that at the time, but I just you know got off on other things since then. And then I was like, okay, let me check this album out. And this song, just really the groove of it, the soulfulness of it. Um, the guitars are really the cool guitars, on it too. The guitars, the walking bass, mm -hmm. but in the back, that super laid back groove and D'Angelo's signature falsetto that yeah. no one sounds like him. Again, like kind of like Billie Holiday. Not that they have the same voice, but they both have their own sound. Like you hear it. Yeah, there's no mistake in no it. No mistake like, That's D'Angelo. Yeah, right. for sure. And so all of it just, and then, you know, I didn't even know. I could, you know, sometimes it's hard to discern the lyrics. You have to look them up when D'Angelo is singing. <laughs> but it doesn't even mm -hmm. matter. Kind of like when someone could tell me to go to hell in Brazilian Portuguese <laughs> and I'm grooving. <laughs> because it's the sound of it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I know he's like, do do wa I'm in really love with you. Um, but see, I'm listening right now to that rock and bass, like ding, ding, ding. yeah, yeah. yeah. So cool. It's just a, it's just a great groove, and it's, and it's, you know, it's kind of sensual. It's kind of, it, and I just love it. I love it, and it, and I love his falsetto and his harmonies, and he's another one like Prince, um, you know, mm -hmm. or any of you know, but he, he, he does it all. He plays so many instruments. He's a visionary. He's creative. Um, and also, this song came out at the same time as, at the, uh, as the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement and, and the killing of Michael Brown, uh, tragically, in Ferguson. And, he, and I remember reading the liner notes for this album, Black Messiah. And one of the messages I thought was so powerful, you know, you, you, read, you think about that, that album, Black Messiah, and you think, is he talking about one leader, like a leader, like Dr. Martin 
Martin Luther King or Malcolm X or Angela Davis or what's he talking about? And he goes into a really thoughtful thing. I, I can't remember all the, one of the main ideas that I took from it was like, it's not about one Messiah. We are all leaders. You are the hero you've been waiting for. What are you doing in your own life? you know, to try and fight for justice. And we all have our own way. We can do that. We're all not supposed to do it in the same way. Some of us are activists. Yeah. Some of us are politicians. Some of us are doing it in the classroom. Some of us are doing it with our music, in our business, how we treat people, what we support, what we don't support. And so I thought that was powerful. And I saw him perform this on Saturday Night Live, the song. I was Remember about that? to say, if you're going to say that uh, you saw this live and you saw him perform live, you're going to make me jealous. No, no, again. no, 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 no. I just watched it on television. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And then I met him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had a drink and I together. Had my guitar, then I, have yeah. a... <laughs> I wish, I wish. I would be so starstruck. I'd be like, maybe I would. I don't know. Starstruck is a weird thing. It seems like the, the ones that are cool, they have a way of like making you feel. Relaxed, because you know they're not mm -hmm. full of themselves. I don't know what he's like, but I, I imagine he'd be like that. Um, but anyway, yeah, I just love this. And another thing, I, so yeah, I saw him perform this on Saturday Night Live, and his whole band had on. I think, um, I think it was Black Lives Matter T-shirts, or maybe it was um, Stop Don't Shoot, maybe or something. I, I can't remember what it was, okay. but they were definitely making a statement, and it was powerful. Even though lyrically, this song doesn't necessarily deal with. Um, you know, racial injustice or um, police brutality, um, that kind of thing. The whole the album does, though, kind of as a body of work, Black Messiah. Mm -hmm. And so I just like that because it reminds me of that time and the kind of awakening for a lot of people with the Black Lives Matter. I remember talking about in my classrooms, not only that, but what was happening on the campus, which at the time, the fraternity that had come out with a racist, um, they, they were exposed for having this like racist, song that they it was part of their like fraternity's tradition that re references yeah. lynching right and so and you know i remember the president at the time of ou david Bourne, was like um no fuera this camp that for, this fraternity is closing down you know um you're all y'all are out and i remember talking about that in my spanish classes that's one of the things also that i try and do in my classes we don't shy away from talking about what's happening and the kids well, were. Well, that's cool. So you, you talk about oh, current yeah, events. Oh, yeah, for and, sure. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Man, you did so much in your class. That's pretty cool. Well, because here's the thing, Luis. I, I'm given a really unique opportunity to influence these kids. They come to my class every day. It's five hour, yeah. five hour a week, five hour classes. So they're, and so I don't take that lightly. Like, not just influence, but to also learn from them, but also give them a space to talk about things that sometimes are silenced or they're not supposed mm -hmm. to talk about. So to me, it's important and it's all connected. So anyway, yeah, I love this jam. Really love D'Angelo. And also one more thing. This is just my music nerd coming out, but I heard Questlove <laughs> interviewed, um, you know, drummer for the Roots, Questlove um, interviewed about working with D'Angelo. Um, I'm not sure if it was on this album or another album, but regardless, he was talking about something that D'Angelo does musically, which I feel like I'm hearing it. I heard it definitely on other tracks on this album, Black Messiah, and I think it's a little bit in this song, Really Love, which is, and I love this, and you know, he's a percussionist. He's talking about how D'Angelo would kind of insist on this groove where the beat would fall just behind the beat. Uh, okay. okay, so, but intentionally, but not so much that you're like, wait, this doesn't sound like it's on rhythm. So it's mm -hmm. in the pocket being out of pocket. So it's just just slightly behind. And when you listen to the song, but do I can't even articulate it because I, musically I'm I'm not used to that kind of um, interpretation rhythmically. But but it's just behind the beat, and I think that's what makes it feel so laid back, and it has a kind of a swing to it. Yeah. Um, and I loved hearing Questlove talk about that. It's like, oh, is that what it is? And is that another like one of the special sauce that you hear in D'Angelo's music, you know? Yeah, that's too cool. Yeah, yeah so. Because you definitely, now that you point that out, I can definitely, going back to some of the tracks, there is sort of this part where you're sort of like left on a cliff and then it comes back. Exactly. And you're like, just, that's what I'm you're talking just about. waiting for that other part to come. Yes, you know? <laughs> and it's subtle. It's subtle. Yeah. Right? Yep. And so I, I, as a musician, you know, I, I totally I love that and respect that. And that's very cool. Cool. So you're always teaching your students, but tell me, 
probably one of the greatest things that a student has taught you. Wow. Okay, there you go with those questions. <laughs> I love it. Those 60 minutes questions. Putting you on the spot again. <laughs> um, no, that's a good one. That's a good one. And there's a lot that my, my students have taught me. Um, wow. I think probably the greatest lesson I have learned, and there's a lot of anecdotes and individual anecdotes that I could, I'm not going to cite, but that have made me come to this lesson from my students, which is that students, um, as a teacher, my one of my biggest, most central jobs is to listen to my students' lived experiences and to be genuinely engaged in my life, not just in the classroom, but in my life, in learning about their lived experiences. So that when I step into the classroom, we can talk about the classroom outside of the classroom. We can honor okay. those experiences. It's not me at the center. It's about building a community and giving space to my students who, you know, may come from communities where their stories haven't been centered. Mm -hmm. and, and that students need that. They want to be heard. They want a space to talk. They want a professor who's honest and who doesn't come in like an embodied professor with no political orientation. I have no lived experiences. I'm quote neutral. You don't get to be neutral. There's no neutral. You know, I come in with my lived experiences, messy. I, I bring humor. I bring my music. I bring my uh, wanting to learn from them too. And so I, I, I've learned to feel more confident in that because some professors don't, they shy from that. They, they feel like yeah. they have to be uphold some kind of hierarchical, disembodied, us and them type thing. Yeah, I, I'm not so naive to think that, of course, you know, they're earning their grade and ultimately their grade is in my hands and stuff. But but I'm more, I'm not interested in that as much as I am interested in creating community, getting to know my students, getting, getting to know each other and engaging in things that challenge their thinking, that excite them about the culture, music, poetry documentaries. Um, so I, I guess just like listening to them. And, and, and I will say last semester, um, we had a sit-in at Evans Hall at the main administration uh, building where the president has mm -hmm. uh, his offices and the provost. The Black Student Union led by the Black Emergency Response Team had created a, a sit-in in response to two professors on the campus who had used the N-word in their class. They didn't call someone the N-word, but they used it freely. Uh, one of them used it comparing the N-word to um, the term a boomer, saying they were equivalent. You know, like the, the whole meme of like, uh, what's that word? Okay, boomer. Oh, uh, where people say like, okay, boomer. Yeah, like kind of. I'm still not making the connection. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah no, there's <laughs> yeah. no connection. No. And, 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 yeah. and saying it as a white professor, okay, as a white male professor, and then another this, two, this was during Black History Month in February. Wow. Then the next two weeks later, a history professor reading a document from um, Times of Slavery, um, ostensibly using her academic freedom to talk about how Black folks were referred to, and she's reading this document, and used the word. She Jeez. could have done the same thing, you know, Talk to them about what it was like for black folks at that time and not use the word. As a white woman, right. she's located in a place where that is not OK, right. located politically speaking. And so anyway, the, the students and many of us in the community were like, no, you are not going to get away, university administration, of saying, oh, that's their mm -hmm. academic freedom. Well, how is it academic freedom when you end up making students feel unsafe in your classroom? when you're not validating people's lived experiences. So they staged a sit-in and they had a number of demands. Um, and all that to tell you is I moved my classes to Evans Hall those days in solidarity. I, my office hours okay. were there and I had some conversations Louise, with my students. Not, and I didn't require all my students to be there because some didn't want to. I said, but that's where I'm having class because I want to mm -hmm. show solidarity. And the ones that did show up for those three days, I had some conversations with some of my students that I could have never have had in the classroom about their yeah. lived experiences, what it's like 
to be black on the OU campus, what it's like to be gay and come from a small, small town in Oklahoma, just like these very personal uh, experiences with feeling marginalized in different spaces. And I was, I just was listening and I felt so humbled, Louise. And I felt like, my God, um, every one of us who was teaching should have that opportunity to put ourselves in spaces where we're listening because and that probably happened because you put yourself in that uncomfortable place right, right. where you're like we're going to take our class over That's there right. that probably would have not happened had you not done exactly that. Right. and i was risking a little bit right like i didn't know well should i do this should i do that and i thought no this is you know i have a right to do this and 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 mm -hmm. it's it's something we need to do for what we believe in and so i guess i just um that is something that my students taught me to answer your questions you know just their That's lived experiences cool. and how that makes me think the next time, you know, I put together a lesson plan. Who am I leaving out? Whose story am I not mm -hmm. addressing here? Who am I? Be? You know, that's important. That's important. Yeah. There's a line that Jay-Z says that he says, you are who you are before you got here. Mm -hmm. And I always go back to that. Like, I can't change who I am. You can't change who you are. You are who you wow. are. You know, and sometimes people try to, you know, portray that there's someone else because they've gone on to college or they're successful now or whatever, but you are who you are before you oh got Oh my God, here. I love that. And I always go back to that. That is brilliant. <laughs> so that's very cool. Brilliant. Let's go talk about uh, the best Woo! part, this next song right here. Daniel Caesar and her. Yeah. Oh. And you specifically said the tiny desk version. Yes. You have to tell me about what's your favorite tiny well, desk. Well, I was actually, we I was actually there. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay and let's all right well that's a wrap <laughs> ladies and gentlemen thanks a lot for checking out the maverick podcast <laughs> i met them i wasn't there. no yeah no well the yeah this is such a popular song and i do love the recorded track but um again it was my kids and i we were just chilling watching um tiny dead we're just like surfing youtube um yeah. and on the couch and we're looking at the screen and we're like let's look, find some cool tiny desk stuff and they looked up daniel caesar and her and i was like oh cool and so we listened to it and um it was just beautiful like the, the live version i don't know if you've heard it but um yeah yeah it's like tiny desk is so tiny cool because desk. it's all stripped down it's stripped and it's down. usually like different instruments right. and a different version all together exactly so for the listeners that don't know it's by NPR, right? right? So they do this series called Tiny Desk where they're literally inside of a tiny like office space, you Very know, and, and right now they're doing it Tiny Desk at home right. because of everything going on. Right. But basically they have a stripped down band, they have stripped down instruments and it's basically, I, I guess you could say it's a more vulnerable version For because sure. you can't hide behind all right. this fancy instrumentation. Right. It's like all about the song and the lyrics basically. Exactly. No, exactly. Yeah, and so that's why I love it because in the live version of Tiny Desk, you can really hear those beautiful back harmonies, the singers. Not only can you hear them, rich harmonies, but you can see them embodying the harmonies um, beautifully. And um, the pianist, oh my God, also, you know, moving, like my mom used to move when she played the piano. Um, mm -hmm. Like they can hear it right now those beautiful harmonies in the back and then just her and daniel caesar they're just beautiful vocalists and just inhabiting the moment with that song and the beautiful tender lyrics you know i just want to see how beautiful you are you know that i see it um and so i love that because it's it's about tenderness it's about honoring beauty um it's another one that my daughters and i love it's one that comes on and we're like turn it up and we just awesome. start harmonizing <laughs> to it um so i just i really dig it and i really like both of those artists those are some of the more recent artists that i've heard that i, I, I like what they're doing her and Daniel yeah Caesar. i would say right now r b is probably kept being kept alive by female artists wow Tell me if you believe that. I I would say like her and like Snow Allegra, like people like that are the ones that are keeping the genre okay. alive. Do you believe that? Well, you need to turn me on to some of these female R&B artists, seriously, because I don't, you know, I have like, I'm like in all different musical genres, but I believe you. I bet you know more than I do about that. So you need to turn me on to some more. Uh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. For, for Have you checked out Snow Allegra? No. Are you familiar I've with heard You that. definitely have to check yeah, her out. Yeah, I've heard that. And maybe yeah. I even heard it about one of your posts or something. Probably. Perhaps. Yeah. yeah. 
I probably bug all my friends all the time with my music posts. Hey man, I think it's like it's your cause. You should do. It. I want yeah, you doing that. Yeah. <laughs> like I feel like I need a support group where we just meet up and we just talk about music. No, I'm there. I'm there. We yeah. bring our drinks and we're on Zoom, right? And just talk about that'd yeah. be fun. Music. Uh, I don't know what we call it. Music. Happy uh, hour. Anonymous. Music or, or not. <laughs> hey, I'm not shy. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not ashamed. And my name is Luis, and I've been uh, on the same track for 24 hours now. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yes. Tell me about your favorite tiny desk. Um, Do you have a favorite? Well, I like that one a lot. Um, I don't know yeah. if that. Let me, start, let me think about that for a second. Miguel did one, which I thought was beautiful. Did you, did you see that? Yeah. With, with his guitarist. Yeah. Have you seen Carlos Vives? I Carlos saw Vives I saw it because you posted it. That's beautiful. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. Carlos Vives. I like Alicia Keys. Alicia Keys. She did an awesome I haven't one. seen that one. I have to see that one. I like um there's one with uh, let's see. You said that's what oh man, you just said someone that reminded me of uh, I can't remember who it is. Oh, uh, Anderson Pat has one that I like a okay. lot. Yeah. And he's yep. on the drums. You can really see him jamming. And mm -hmm. I just love his rhythm. Oh my God, like his, his, that rhythm and the opening track of that, or the opening song of that tiny desk is beautiful. Oh, uh, Khalid. I think Khalid does a yeah. beautiful tiny desk. You can really hear yeah, his pure cool. voice. I like um, Jorge Drexler, who was one, the, one of the artists on my top 10. He did one with his band, um, which was beautiful. I, I loved it. And who else? I just like a lot of them. I think they're really, like you said, like a totally unique opportunity to hear some of these songs in a different yeah. version. And it's just very intimate. It's a lot more vulnerable. It's, vulnerable. it's like intimate. It is totally it's probably what you get to experience meeting all these different artists that you meet all the time. All the time. <laughs> yes. This yes. is as close as I can get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Tell me, uh, so when you're listening to music, because you're a musician yourself, do you think you experience music differently? Do you focus on like maybe uh, the way they use the instruments or are you hearing mistakes that, or things they could have done differently? Or can you just sort of listen to it in the background like most people do? Well, I definitely can't really listen to it in the background. That's a problem for me in driving. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, in fact, today, I was listening to my, I made a, I made a Spotify list of my top 10 songs um, that I'm doing with you today, just so I could be mm -hmm. in the groove of it. And, and I was coming back from my early morning grocery shopping and I went to the wrong destination because I was so into the song I was listening to. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> At least I didn't you know, get in That's an awesome. accident, but no, I, I yeah. can't. So I, I guess probably to answer your question, I mean, I don't know how I would, everyone, whether you're a musician or not, experiences things uniquely, um, music included. And so, but I would say that um, I, I just personally, me, um, I think I tend to, I tend to hone in on music more than lyrics initially. Okay. Which is, I All noticed right. that. I noticed that it's like, my, it's interesting though, because my kids, like both of them, they'll learn lyrics really quick to a song. Wow. Yeah. And I'm like, how Usually it's the other way around. Usually people, it's the hook right, or the, right. the, the, the instrumentation or the beat that gets people right. like into the song and they don't even know what the song is talking about. Right, right, right. <laughs> and that's kind of how I am too, though. Like I get into the music mm -hmm. and then I'll obsess. Like we were talking about, like I, if there's a song that I dig, there might be one little, like, you know, like eight bars of something. I'm like, oh my God, and I'm living for that moment in the song. <laughs> You know, and I'll play it over and over, like, oh, yep. <laughs> play it again, play it again. I, yeah. You know how that is. So I guess, um, yeah, I just, music is everything to me. That's one of the things I teach my students in Spanish. The phrase is, musica es medicina. You know, mm -hmm. it's a transformative thing, both personally and con collectively. And it's just, it just is. That's what I know to be true. And it could be a bad drug, too, because if For you're sure. down, you can listen <gasps> to music that's going to get you even that in a worse so state, right? <laughs> like, sometimes I do that to myself and I'm like, what are you doing? What are you like, doing? You're <laughs> like, listen to something completely oh, different of what yeah. you're, you're feeling, right? Man, like some of those crying your tequila rancheras. <laughs> oh, Man, yeah. I remember when I lived in Mexico, yeah. sometimes like, but at least it would be a collective like sadness i remember being at some clubs and stuff and everybody knew the lyrics to like volver volver el rey even mm -hmm. like with our some of our parties like hasa and pan am back in the day at ou 
everyone knew the lyrics. So at least if you were yep. really feeling it, you know, <laughs> um, at least you weren't alone. You right. Know? And at that point, I think it was more of a celebration. So That's people true. would just hug That's each other, true. sing along. Like you, it man. was a happy moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was like the go to at the end the of the party for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so true. What are some of your goals that you, you sort of have for yourself here uh, coming up in the next few years? Goals. Oh, I have a lot of dreams and goals. Um, well, one thing I think about a lot, it kind of speaking to your earlier point about being an entrepreneur, um, I feel I know that I have done unique things in the classroom. I know that I have a way of creating spaces of connection and joy through multimedia. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I have the very unformed beginnings of an idea of maybe trying to do that on my own, being business for myself, maybe doing it. I don't know even what that would look like, but I know folks want to learn Spanish, but not everybody, you can pick up Duolingo or Rosetta Stone, but, but some people also want not just Spanish, but they want something that makes their soul feel good. Something that connects them with music, something that connects them with culture culture yeah. yeah so i'm thinking how could i market that <laughs> how could i yeah. you know um it's a space i feel comfortable in you know like taking people i don't know you know meeting these 19 20 uh usually my classes are 19 or 20 students you know of people mm -hmm. and, and how are we create try to create community so i don't know i'm thinking about that you know branching out some way um, not being connected to an institution per se and doing it for myself. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Yeah, I, I need to talk to you about that. that because you have more, you're doing so well. I admire what you're doing with your own business and platform and I need to get ideas The thing from about you. me is like, I'm a dreamer and I'm just like, why not? Well, so and I just try new things. Yeah, you know? and you figure it yeah. out as you go. You figure it out as you yep, go. For sure. And you know, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter who's the photography started her business. She's very encouraging of me. She, it's awesome to talk to her because she's like, yeah, you can do this, 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 and this. And and so that's really that's really exciting to dream like that with my kids. Um, I um, want to keep on playing music, keep on writing music forever until I can't mm -hmm. until I, you know, until I'm gone. I want to do that and leave those <laughs> songs as my legacy. And yeah. I want I, I we're thinking about what well, I like to call it defecting, making an exodus from Oklahoma. Um, it's been something I've been thinking for a while. My, you know, I've taken my daughters mm -hmm. back to Santa Cruz and the Bay Area many times. Of course, right now is, is not the time to make a move, but um, they're interested in moving out that way. And so okay. am I. I dream of living again next to the ocean. Um, oh, it says, oh, it says, okay. I, I can make sure we're not timed out here. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, I, w I would love to live near the Pacific Ocean again. And, you know, I'm, um, I see myself there. I see I, okay. it's a, a huge source of inspiration for me. The land there, the ocean, the, the redwood forest. Um, I know the whole planet is under threat of climate chaos and climate crisis. Um, and still in all, I, that's where I want to be. And, and I mm -hmm. have a lot of, I just, I vibe more with that area of the world, just in terms of culturally and the place and, and, and don't get me wrong, I love people here in Oklahoma, some of the people that I've connected with and some of the spaces. But, but you know, I think I don't think it's, you know, unfair to say that Oklahoma largely is pretty conservative. Um, you yep. know what I mean? And I'm just tired of that. <laughs> and, and I feel like, you know, I'm not getting any younger. I'm young at heart, always will be, but I want to be where I want to be. I like that. And then we also have to put your album. We have to make you accountable. Yes. We're gonna record, that is, we're gonna record your song. That is a huge one. My mom is also she's like, Mika, yeah. you have to do that. So yeah, yeah, for sure. So we're gonna put it on the show to put it, a little bit of it's pressure. Been, it's out there that. now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Tell me about Jorge Drexler, Jorge, this next track right yeah, here. Yeah, um, this song's called Movimiento. It came out in 2017 by Jorge Drexler. He is one of my all time most um, artists that I admire the most. He is originally from Uruguay. Um, he has lived in Brazil. Um, he's traveled all around the wor world with his, as a performing artist, but 
he was actually a doctor first, you know. He was he was a otor, really? ¿cómo se dice? Uh, ear, nose, throat doctor. Otoroni longo. Ándale, ah, eso. <laughs> it is so difficult that's a, that's to say. A hard one. <laughs> yeah, he trained for yeah. that, and 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 in Uruguay, and was working doing that mm -hmm. for a while. But he was always a musician from from beginning. He said, in his home, they always had everything in the house, from bossa nova to the Beatles to like you know, he had a very musical household. Um, and anyway, so at, at one point, I think it's Jorge Sabina, the Spanish artist, was touring in, in Uruguay and meeting some local musicians. And Jorge was playing. Even though he was a doctor in the day, he played. He gigged at night. And he met him. And he encouraged him. He said, you need to come to Spain. You need to come to Spain. I really think you could do something with your music and, and get out there more into, the, you know, not only Europe, but the Latin American market. And he did. And, and I think he was already, like, maybe 30 or something when he did that. And... Anyway, he really has a huge following in Latin America and in the world. Maybe not so much in the United States. Um, he won an Oscar, I think, in 2004 for his title track of the that movie. He, he wrote the, um, was it Oscar for best song from a movie? Um, yeah, okay. and it was the first time a non-English song had won. And it was for that movie called Motorcycle Diaries about the early life uh, of okay. Che Guevara. And it's a beautiful yeah, yeah. track. But and actually Prince presented him with the award. Prince read that yeah. Wow. And he went up and guess <laughs> check this out. I, this is also why I love Jorge Drexler. Because he's not mainstream. He, he doesn't mm -hmm. care about that. They told him, the organizers of the Oscars said, you can't perform your song even though it's nominated. We're gonna have Antonio Banderas and Carlos Santana Santana play your song because you're not a very visible Latino to the gringos or to the mainstream market. Wow. And so what he did when they when he won it, he went up there and his acceptance speech was him singing the entire first verse a cappella in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Man. So he, he ended up singing it on the Oscar stage. Yeah. So anyway, but this, wow. yeah, so I discovered him probably right before I became a mom for the first time, like around 2004. One of his masterpiece albums called Echo, I, I got into. It's like one of those albums that's just as a body of work and then every individual song is just so rich and amazing. And then I just followed him ever since. Um, I love him because like this song, Movimiento, like I think one of the main things in the chorus is, yo no soy de aquí, pero tú tampoco. Yo no soy de aquí, pero tú tampoco. You're not from here, but neither am I. You're not from here, but nor am I. De ningún lado del todo, de todos lados un poco. So ultimately, we're not really from, we're not all the way, from, not from any one place, but from a little bit from every place. And that's a recurring theme yeah. in his song lyrics, is this kind of honoring of our multicultural heritages that we all, if you look far back enough, even though your family's been here for the, this whole business of, you know, we are a people who move. This song is called Movimiento, Movement. Um, he said in an interview, you know, migration and movement is our human birthright. You know, all of us are here as a revol result of somebody having to have made some kind of movement. Even native peoples, original peoples, you know, from the Americas, moved or were forced off. Many African Definitely. people of African yeah. descent, whether the movement was forced, whether the movement was intentional, whether it was unfortunately violent, or whether it was on the heels of a dream movement. So I, I, he's one of those kinds of guys who in his lyrics, he just gets to the heart of our humanity and it, he does it poetically. And that's a hard thing to do. Yeah. And, he, and I love his, his vocal style is very laid back. It's very effortless. He's a great guitarist. Um, he's just a very organic musician and I respect him so much. Cool. Yeah, I like yeah. that. That's I've never heard his stuff, so now I'm gonna oh, have to go and check him cool. out. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 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 This. That's really cool, especially hearing the story that he used to be a doctor and then he just left that to to be an artist. That's pretty yeah. Cool. And it's kind of cool, like you know, you see that different. Like as a doctor, he made an interview recently where he was saying, you know, I see a lot of connections with being a doctor and the healing aspect of it, and also the healing aspect of music. And he is super attuned to sound, you know, um, mm -hmm. and how things sound. And, you know, I, it's just not, a, you, you can see those connections. How maybe, you know, an ear, nose, throat doctor, not every, you know, some folks get into that because of the money, but clearly he right. didn't, you know, and he's super intelligent. The, the dude is brilliant, but he's humble. 
he's humble and that's a hard combination to come by you know yeah cool i like yeah. that tell me about your favorite uh show or presentation do you have a favorite memory of one of your performances um, that, I, that i performed yeah oh oh man i have a lot but let me think about one that stands out um let me see we got to play with the canterbury uh choral uh choir of oklahoma city on this uh civic stage civic center stage oh, yeah wow. that was cool. cool i they were doing a um a latin american theme and so i got to participate with that and other artists latin latino artists um shannon calderon may she rest in peace and power she was a beautiful flamenco dancer she was there that night eddie cruz mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know was up there um but that's probably not my favorite my favorite i would have to say is the tour that we do every summer and we did it virtually this past summer with the neighborhood arts program it's sponsored by oklahoma city arts council and the metropolitan libraries and they get funding from the national endowment for the arts too and what we've done for many summers now um, before the virtual one this summer we would go we go for two weeks we go like on a tour of 25 libraries that are part of the metropolitan library system and yeah, I didn't okay. know, but I mean, you have everything from like, you know, your urban, very like downtown, like downtown library. Um, then, you know, like Northeast, Northwest, Northeast 23rd, the Ralph Ellison Library. And then like, you know, the, mm -hmm. the Latino side, you know, uh, in the Capitol Hill district. And then out in these little towns in Jones, Oklahoma and awesome. Choctaw. <laughs> and we show up and they come and it's part of their summer. It's free entertainment for them. We're yeah. getting paid nicely, by the way, which is nice as mm. a musician. And um, it's so great to show up. And these and the audiences are all ages. Um, and these kids that, you know, they've never heard a charango. They've never heard a siku. Or maybe they've never heard the story behind this song, La Bamba, how its roots are African, you know. Or they've never had a chance to learn the salsa or, you know, they don't. We just do a very interactive performance with them that gets them and we okay. tell them from the jump we're like this is your party we didn't come to talk at you we didn't you don't have to sit there and mm -hmm. politely clap you're gonna get up get down you're gonna come up here and play instruments with us this is our party y'all are part of alegria real cool. and it's just what's the response at the smaller towns because because they've probably never been exposed right? to some it of this varies. stuff right so what kind of response do it you get it varies you know sometimes we've had everything from like just wild excitement like this is what i've been waiting for <laughs> <laughs> bring it awesome. you know what i mean like yeah like i remember one kid at the end of one show is like could you do the whole thing again the whole show again like when we finished you know? <laughs> yeah, this is the best thing i've been doing all summer <laughs> to, to to but you know but then honestly there's been sometimes when people are just because they're not exposed it just they are very much like just the quiet audience just kind of politely clapping even as much as we try mm -hmm. and encourage them that's just hard for them to do and that's okay sure. you know but anyway i, I would say that's my favorite times because it's very you feel like you're really planting seeds because largely audiences are young and and they're kids so there's this very like palpable sense of like um not only am i creating maybe some joy at this moment in time but hopefully i'm planting some kind of seed maybe maybe i've broadened their mind a little bit more about what they think of when they think of latino latino people cultures uh, or maybe they got interested in, and they got up here and they played one of Armando's congas and went, wow, that felt cool. I want to play the conga, well, you know? So that, that feels yeah. important to me and, and satisfying. Cool. I like that. So we're about to approach to the last Aye. song on your list, unfortunately. <laughs> but before we do that, uh, I always give an opportunity to the guests to ask a question. So if you could ask a question to the listeners, what would it be? And it could be something simple right like or, or it could be something more you know to make people think about you know their life or their experiences or what's going on in the yeah. world so it's your question okay. what would be the question for the okay. audience to 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 the listeners to the audience okay yes yeah i would ask you what are you doing in the spaces that you find yourself that creates pleasure and joy for yourself and therefore you know kind of you leading by example what what brings you 
real soul pleasure, soul satisfaction, joy. Um, and, and how are you incorporating that into the spaces you find yourself? Whether you be a okay. lawyer, teacher, uh, you know, a barista, um, a mechanic, uh, as a stay at home mom, you know, as a nurse, like, how do you embody that? How do you embody joy and pleasure? Because I think that, um, you know, there's kind of, oftentimes we have this binary notion of work and play. You know, I don't work mm -hmm. and that's got to kind of be a grind and it's got to feel stressful and you know, tight shoulders. And then there's ah, play. But I feel like more and more, and especially in the times we're living in, there has to be a way in which we, because people are stressed, people are, are hurting in all kinds of ways. I've seen it in my students, I've seen it in my family. People are suffering in all kinds of ways and we need to make spaces. That's why I try to do this like with my classes, like create spaces yeah. for joy, check in with them. Hey, everybody in the Zoom chat, put one word that describes how you're feeling today and it doesn't have to be great. Let's just do a mood check. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I teach them the word animo in Spanish. And I go, this is kind of awesome. cool because it's one of those unique situations where it's one word in Spanish, but it means so many things. It's like, be encouraged. I see you. You're going to get through this. And like we did an animo check on Friday. We said everybody's name and said, animo, <laughs> and gave them animo. And then I said, can you guys give me animo? Unmute yourselves, okay, y'all? Animo, they mm -hmm. tell me. So I think it's important because life is short. And you yeah. not only... I just feel like you deserve it. We all deserve to experience pleasure and joy. Wow, that's very cool yeah. because I think at work, a lot of people probably put on this work persona, like you said, yeah. right? But they're limiting. Like we all have our own like skills and stories and we can, you know, incorporate that into our correct. jobs. You're correct. And you're adding to the experience. You're adding to the relationships. You're adding to your work life balance right. right so that's really cool yeah I like and i it. think that also you can it, and that'll look different for for everybody because what brings you joy and pleasure is different depending on who you are mm -hmm. um but i think what you, you can't fake genuine enthusiasm folks know what you're really passionate about right and so yeah. that's contagious right so i think that's cool. important Awesome. I like it. All right. So we're going to end with the party. <laughs> Proyecto Uno. Dime si son Latinos. <laughs> Dime si son Latinos. I love this. This one. is a great right? track. Yeah. I mean, I hear this yeah. and right away, I can't, I just want to get up. It's a dance track. I yep. love it. Listen to that. Montuno. Dun, 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 that is the classic one. If I could learn how to play that in a piano, oh, I'd you, be happy. If I could, you could just learn do that, that over and over. You could totally <laughs> learn that. Yeah. No, that's, that's called a montuno. You hear that in so many salsa okay. tunes, right? Yeah. It's that that yeah. repeated thing. Oh, you can, yeah, you need to learn that. Um, awesome. But, but see, this song, I don't have to tell you. I mean, this was the jam at all. I recently posted on Facebook. I go on a throwback Thursday. I said, hey, you know, who remembers? Um, who remembers tearing it up to this song, right? And Gaius, our mm -hmm. friend Gaius George, and Kathy Turk, all of our beautiful friends from back in the day. They're like, oh, yep, yep, I remember. And some, someone oh, even yeah. put on the comments, oh, yeah, <laughs> Tulio's parties, you know, parties at Tulio's restaurant, Pan Am parties. Mm -hmm. So this is just, it's just a, I think of this as a song about cultural pride. Um, you know, they shout out all the countries. España, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, Santo Domingo. They say Santo Domingo because it's, mm -hmm. they're Dominicans, right? They mentioned, that's the one city they mentioned. Because I think Pro, Pro, Proyecto <laughs> Uno, the, the band, I think they're all Dominican. But, um, yeah. but I just love the jam because it's so festive. It just gets you dancing. It has I have good memories of like parties, jamming to this, and oh, everyone's yeah. on the floor, just feeling it. And it's also Spanglish, which is way cool. I love the Spanglish. Um, mm -hmm. I love how they shout out all the countries in Latin America. And the, the last one they say is Bolivia. I'm feeling ya. <laughs> I love how they rhyme that. Yeah. And um, and uh, it's just that, you know, it's a festive cool. thing. I have good memories. You played this in your class oh, yeah. before? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I tell them, and you know, because, awesome. you know, in terms of, what was that Jay-Z quote? I, I came here before I was 
you you are who you are. Before yeah, you yeah. So you know, I mean, they know me. I'm of a certain age, yeah. right? Like I like, th and I tell them <laughs> this was the jam in the mid '90s. Okay, yeah. I said, get on your feet. Tell me this doesn't make you want to move. Tell me it doesn't in 2020. And you know, and they get mm -hmm. up and we dance and. And I love that it has that merengue house type vibe, right? So it's very yeah. like multicultural and- But it doesn't feel dated. Right? Like you could still play this today and I don't think it sounds I like agree. a disco track or something. Exactly, like, exactly. Yeah, it doesn't, dated. you don't think of it like, oh man. Exactly, it's beyond, it's beyond that. And I had this vision as I was listening to this, I was like, what if we, I would love to hear like a remix of this in 2021. And I'm thinking like, instead of Dime Si Son Latinos, it could be, Dime si son Latinx, dime si son Latin. And yeah. it could be like, it could be like <laughs> Rosalia and Maluma fronting it or something. Wow. And then Logic, Man, Logic awesome. rapping on it. I know he's not like mainstream, but, it, but I, he could kill it. Yeah. Wouldn't that be cool? cool? I can, think you need to pitch you, that. You need to pitch that. What do you that. think? <laughs> what, can you vision it? You, use your, use your music use connection. Your make a, a call to those lowels <laughs> or somebody. I was listening. <laughs> call I was up. listening. I was like, wouldn't that be cool? But anyway, That's yeah, cool. I like so it. I just, this is one of those, and I guess at the end of the day, you know, for me, like one of the things that brings me so much joy is dancing, period. Like I love to dance mm -hmm. and I'm always, I'm just for good or for bad. I'm one of those people that I don't need a drink in me to be the first one on the floor. I'm not worried about embarrassing myself. And um, I just love dancing. So, awesome. Yeah. It's part of my heritage. <laughs> this is too. a great track to end yeah. with. Yeah. So if people want to follow you, do you want to shout out your band or any social media or anything? Um, well, we have a Facebook page for Alegría Real. Um, we're not super active on it just because we're playing a lot. And like Armando Rivera plays in several bands. He plays with Latin yeah. Mojo too. Um, yeah, he's always playing oh, all yeah. over. I always he's see amazing. him. He's <laughs> amazing. Even during the week, it could be like a random Tuesday or Wednesday exactly. or something. And he's playing. He's on somewhere. his way to a gig. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but yeah, no. But I think that's it. I'm not very good about that. You know, like being on social media. So I have my like my little Facebook page for me and everything. But no Instagram for the band or anything. No, not yet. No. no? Okay. But thanks for the right. opportunity. And you were. Sure. You guys were doing like live performances on your. Was it your page or was it the. Arts Council. Oh, Arts page, Council. I remember I, I saw a couple of yeah. streams. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, on the Arts Council okay. and also on the Metropolitan Library. And then we also recently okay. did, um, we recently did, we recorded a concert um, just outside at a park in, in Oklahoma City um, for mm -hmm. a festival that's been happening for a few years now. It's an annual festival called the Wiggle Out Loud Festival. And it's a, a festival okay. that's associated with um, the Children's Hospital and their volunteer network. And it's, it, they used to always do it like on the Myriad stage. Myriad Garden stage and um, it's for mm -hmm. families and stuff and we've, we've worked with them live in the past but this year we're like we want to still do it but you know with the pandemic so we did we recorded a concert for that so yeah Wiggle Out Loud festival okay um, so if people wanted to check those out there on the Arts Council Facebook page uh, Arts Council and then also uh, I believe it's called the Wiggle Out Loud festival page yeah okay cool yeah. awesome all right, well, we got through your playlist. That was an awesome Thank playlist. I feel you. like we went through this awesome journey. Thank you. You know, multiple cultures, multiple timelines. Like, it was a really cool playlist. So, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to do Gra this. Gracias a ti. Gracias a ti. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you have another episode of the Maverick Podcast. Just chill to the next episode. <laughs>